what you do. Can I do that? Okay. Uh, so I just want to um, have you understand that the cancer biology site research uh, faculty cover a very wide array of topics, which you'll hear about as you listen to your students uh, give their talks. And this is just uh, the hallmarks of cancer and, and all these different angles impact uh, how cancer uh, grows, interacts, changes. Uh, and in fact, um, there's also tumor microenvironment interactions at both the primary site where the tumor develops and when it starts to metastasize and travels to other tissues, it has its own special interactions there. And all of those are things we need to understand and potential targets to prevent or get rid of the cancer. So this talk's really about thanking everybody who helped create this summer. Uh, so first up are the 12 faculty who opened their labs to take in one or two students. Um, and it's really been a um, remarkable thing. We have quite a large number of new faculty who haven't done this with the cancer biology site before. So it's been really great to sort of have all these new, new people contributing. Um, so I think eight out of our 12 are newbies to the cancer biology site. Uh, these are the people that are the hands-on people in the laboratories that your students have done their day-to-day -day work with for the most part. Um, so we can't operate without the volunteering of both the faculty, the PIs, and the people in their lab who actually work with your students. And then, of course, we presented a bunch of talks and, and learning opportunities, and all of these people, in one way or another, uh, contributed to those efforts, including my daughter there at the top, Rebecca Aron. Um, so they've shared their experiences, what they've learned, their pathways, their science in some cases, and how to get around in college and all sorts of different uh, learning opportunities. Uh, so this is the admissions committee that selected your students to apply with a lot of reading. Uh, and these are the people, Malabika and myself and Andrew Orenberg, who's a second year graduate student sitting right there, who's been an absolutely amazing contributor and godson because I was on vacation and Malabika got sick and Andrew just stepped it up. And uh, he, is, he is magic man. He really has a flair for teaching and he's very responsible and he just volunteered to do things that weren't his job uh, when we couldn't do it. And um, I think he's been a great role model for your students. Um, <laughs> you sent me the photo, so you up. <laughs> uh, so, and then of course there are the fearless leaders and program coordinators and project managers that run the whole academy. I just have to run one site. And yeah, we're missing a picture of everybody. Somehow we didn't manage to do that this summer. So maybe just when we're done with all the talks, we can have a quick gathering of students and try to get a group photo who can send out to everyone afterwards. So what have your students been doing all summer? Well, they've been learning how to pipette. This is uh, one of the senior faculty teaching Kate how to pipette. And then you see they did a lot of pipetting. And then they did some more pipetting. But now they're, now, and they're doing some cell culture work. So they're keeping things sterile. Can you imagine teenagers having to be neat? And there, <laughs> there's more help cell culture. And then, okay, so now you get your cells, you play with them, you look at them, and you put them back. <laughs> and then you rinse and repeat. <laughs> But not everything is sitting at the culture hood and pipetting and pipetting and pipetting. There is actually visualization of science in, in other ways. And so you can see we do high-tech microscopy. Some more of that, visualizing science. And this is another way you can see there's a, on, uh, there's a video up there of a surgery in progress and looking at a dye that is staining parts of the field. This, hopefully telling the surgeon something important. You'll hear about it. And uh, Audrey over there, who's um, doing some Western blotting, that's another thing that many of your students have done copious quantities of. And then they have to detect the uh, protein at the end. And here's Audrey doing some more of that with her mentor, Susu. 
and Nancy is doing some more lot reading, I guess. I'm not sure. Uh, and then Donovan's just starting the happy time. And there is Levi. Science is fun, folks. We wear them out, but we do let them eat at last. And they've done some outings or just all kinds of gatherings with their, these are the mentors in their labs and your students. Some more of them. It's Mohammed in his lab. And see, they eat out or in. So I just wanted to remind everybody that when you're up here, it's the camera from the laptop here that is gonna be showing you while you're talking to people who are zooming in. So please don't go walking down here away from the camera. If you are a walker, try to make it go with you, but mostly stay put. Um, and we will be hooking people up either with this if you prefer to hold it, or we can put one that hangs on you. Uh, and clips on. So you'll be mic that works best for both for the Zoom people to hear as well as the people in the audience. Um, there will be a 15 minute break at 1030 and hopefully the refreshments will still be there. Uh, lunch will be down the hall, sort of you go out and then left, you saw those chairs and tables a little bit in your vision screen, that's where lunch will be. 2 p.m. There's going to be a closing ceremony for the entire academy back in this room. And um, hopefully we'll remember to take the group picture at the end of this before we head to lunch. Okay, and I'm done. And we are ready for our first speaker. And he's going to be introduced. Let me get out of stop sharing. There we go. Stop share. Uh, okay, and Tim Burns. Okay, so Tim. Yes, yeah, so thanks, Deb. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce uh, Leviticus McGraw Sapp, or as we know him as Levi. Uh, so Levi is a rising senior this year at Woodland High School, uh, Woodland Hills High School. And it, it, it's kind of interesting. He came to us with kind of a strong interest in medicine, especially in anesthesiology, which um, is a little unusual, but pretty cool that he has a goal already. Um, and so uh, this summer was about two things. One is to teach him about kind of cancer research and, and lung cancer and the treatment of lung cancer, but also give him exposure to what he might be interested in. So um, I thought it was cool that we were able to get him into the operating room, not with myself, I'm not a surgeon, but one of our thoracic surgeons where he's actually able to uh, see what anesthesiologists do and see what the surgeries do. And so I think, you know, the, the goal of the summer, I think as Deb has talked about, is really to kind of expose these students to kind of what their future may be. Um, in the lab, uh, Levi really grew over the summer and really kind of took on additional responsibilities, additional assays, and actually has some stuff ongoing. Um, and I'm really hoping he got a little bit of, um, learned a little bit of how we try to actually target cancer cells in the labs and how we try to bring this to the clinic. Um, on a personal note, um, Levi was just great in the lab. Um, he was a uh, very friendly demeanor, but worked very hard. Um, and I think that was noticed and appreciated by you know, all the students. Um, I have students at all levels in my lab. They all commented on how hard he worked and uh, just the attitude he had. And I think that will serve him well. Um, on that note, I have no doubt that Levi has a bright future ahead of him. And I, I really look forward to seeing him progress uh, through his training and his career. And, you know, I think um, I'm excited to see, but I have no, no, no doubt that he'll be successful. So with no further ado, Levi will tell us a little bit about his work in the lab this summer. So Levi, thanks again for all your hard work. And sorry, I couldn't be here today.
Halo. Oh. Ya. Good. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Leviticus McGraw Sapp, and I'm a rising senior at the Woodland Hills High School. This is Dr. Ben Sid. And this summer, I conducted research in the Burns Lab under the mentorship of both Dr. Renard Kumar and Dr. Burns. And over the course of this summer, I focused on non small cell lung cancer and how twist one in targeting it could affect lung cancer. So the title of my presentation is Targeting MET-Driven Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Through Inhibiting Twist 1. So have you ever met a person with non-small cell lung cancer? I know Dr. Burns has, but I'm not just saying that because he works in the clinic. I'm saying that because of the probability of meeting a person with non-small cell lung cancer due to the fact that it is the second most common form of cancer, not including lung cancer. Of those diagnosed, almost half of them will die, killing more people than colorectal, breast, and prostate cancer combined. That is why it is surprising to learn that it is significantly less funded than those three. So there are various causes for this form of cancer and various pathways that this cancer can take in order to achieve this or the cells can take in order to achieve this. However, when cancer decides to take a certain pathway, it becomes addicted to that pathway and relents in changing its course. Don't fret, however, because approximately 50% of these pathways are targetable, one of which being the MET gene alteration which I studied this year. Now we can target the MET pathway by using FDA approved drugs, such as those listed on the slide, these three right here. Though these drugs are not always effective due to how often the MET pathway is dysregulated. This dysregulation leads to the overexpression of twist one and epithelial mesenchymal transition transcription factor. And this overexpression leads to de novo or acquired resistance to targeting therapy, thus reducing the chances of an effective chemotherapy or radiation therapy, radiation treatment. So as I stated earlier, twist one is an EMT transcription factor, which means it mediates the process of epithelial cells losing their polarity and fixed positions and taking on the phenotype of a mesenchymal cell, thus increasing their motility. This motility is the key part of what allows non-small cell lung cancer to metastasize. And, and the overexpression of twist one also leads to inhibition of senescence and apoptosis within cancerous cells. And that notion brought us to the question, what would happen if we were to target twist one? Well, in the Burns lab, we believe that inhibiting twist one via targeting therapy would decrease cell viability by inducing cellular senescence, we could target twist one with a drug called Harmac, which works by inhibiting and denaturing the twist one protein, thus altering its function as a result, meaning that it should decrease the overall resistance of the cell to met tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So I tested my hypothesis using first a short term assay, known as an MTS assay and second, a long-term assay known as a colony formation assay. Now, allow me to explain. An MTS assay is a basic assessment that determines the percentage of viable cells in proliferation. The way it functions is that when placed in the well, the MTS solution is yellow. As MTS encounters the cells, they bioreduce it and transform it into formicin, which deprives MTS of its yellow hue. This results in a situation in which the more viable cells you have that are present, the darker the solution and the wells will appear. Cytotoxicity, whether the drug kills the cancer cells, is also measured. This is performed at both early and late time points. So one of the first cell lines that I assayed was the H596 met mutant. Its mutation is an exon 14 skip mutation. And as you can see, per the hill slope, 
for this slope right here, there was a decrease in cell viability as the concentration of the drug was increased at 48 hours. At 72 hours, there is little to no change, meaning that the cells neither gain nor lose sensitivity. At 120 hours, there was a significant leftward shift in the data. Now this leftward shift is caused, or we suppose that it is caused by a delayed effect brought by hormone, which could lead to an increase in sensitivity. This delayed effect provides an evidence of senescence, which is the natural aging of cells within the eventual death. We would conduct a beta gal staining, and a beta gal staining works by, by taking X gal and an enzyme that is present when cells senesce that will, that will dissociate that molecule into a sugar and into another molecule, which then dimerizes and forms a blue precipitate at low pH conditions. This is what that will look like in actual H596 cells. The next cell line that I assayed was the H1437 cell line, which also has the same mutation. But this can be a little bit more sensitive because as you can see, unlike the previous graph, we do not have a 48 hour, a 72 hour, or 120 hour time point. And that's due to the great variability and inconsistence within that data. So at the 144 time point, nonetheless, a similar trend to the H596 cell line can be seen as you increase your concentration of the drug hormone, there is a decrease in the cell viability. Now we move on to a different MET alteration, the H1993 MET AMP, MET AMP being the alteration, the H1993 cell line. So as you can see here at the 48 hour time point, you can see an initial shallow slope which is then followed by an increase in the steepness of that slope, meaning that the cell viability, it decreases greater over the increasing concentrations of your drug. At the 72 hour time point, the line starts to, it starts at a higher position right here, and then it decreases and towards the end, it follows that same pattern as that, 48 hour time point, meaning that the cell viability begins to decrease similar at in the 72 hour time point, just as it did in the 48 hour time point. The final cell line that I performed an MTS assay on was the H1648 cell line, which is also a MET amp alteration. Like the previous graphs, at 48 hours, as the hormone concentration is increased, more cells begin to die. At 144 hours, there's a leftward shift in the graph. And similar to that of H596, meaning this leftward shift means that there's a delayed effect. And again, this delayed effect is hinting at the possibility of cellular senescence. So this brings me to my long-term assay, the colony formation assay which focuses on cell lines ability to form colonies, which is a key trait of cancer cells. This works by plating cells in a 12 well plate at low densities, allowing them to grow for 24 hours and then treating them with the drug Harman. And then after then we wait from anywhere from two to three weeks, depending on the growth, and when the colonies are visible to the naked eye, you hold it up to a light, you hold it up to a light. That's when you stain with crystal violet. And after that, you count the colonies and see how the drug has acted upon those cells. So for this assay, the data is slightly different. I don't have a graph as I did for the MTS assays. However, I have the actual 12 volt plate. So for this, as depicted by the first column, you see colonies forming. However, in comparison to the second column, 
in which has 2.5 micromoles of hormone compared to that control, the first column, there's slightly more colonies present. Now that's most likely due to a technical error on my part. However, from there on, from the 2.5 to the five, all the way to the 10, you can see a decrease in cell colonies. And this is what we want. This tells us that hormone, our drug that we use is actually working and killing off the cells. So from our data, we can conclude that when treated with, when treated with the twist one inhibitor hormone, the cell viability decreases across all four met altered non-small cell lung cancer cell lines. And the delayed effect noticed in the cell lines during the MTS assays is heavily suggested to be caused by the reactivation of oncogene-induced senescence. And as of now, our current and future directions will be ensuring that senescence is responsible for the noticed enhanced effects across the four cell lines. We want to look at determining the contributions of apoptosis to this process. You want to figure out whether or not Harman is able to sensitize these cell lines to met tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And we want to look at and review more potent Harman analogs and possibly develop more effective Harman derivatives. So right now, I just want to give a thanks to all my mentors, the Cancer Biology Site and University of Pittsburgh for having me be a part of the program and for one great summer. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wen, and I'm a co-mentor uh, in Dr. S.J. Gauss lab, and I'm right now at postdoc. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce Daniel to you guys today. Actually, Daniel has already spent two months last summer in one of our Pitt faculty's lab and learn about the basic laboratory techniques, uh, including the biochemistry, immunology, and proteomics. And in the meanwhile, you know what? He also attended the lab meeting from the other Pitt faculty lab uh, member and he learned about the uh, machine learning and bioinformatics. So he was already overqualified when he joined our lab. And I was so thrilled to work with him. So when I first met Daniel, I noticed that he's a pretty, a little bit quiet boy. But after a few days, I found out actually he's very sharp and then curious, and actually he has a sense of humor. <laughs> and then he's a very sweet young man. So uh, Daniel actually is very dedicated to learning and he will always try to gain the knowledge in the field. It was like when I briefly introduced uh, to him about something or some mechanism, he will always try to find relevant literature by himself, and then he will bring more questions, more thoughtful questions to bug me, which I like him very much. <laughs> so Daniel is very bright, and I have no doubt that he will have a beautiful future and a successful career. So now, Daniel. All right, okay, this works. All right, so over the summer, I've been working on uh, my project on M6A modification and chromatin remodeling influence on KSHV lytic replication. And so to go into a brief introduction into KSHV, so KSHV is also known as human herpes virus 8 and is part of the gamma herpes virus subfamily. And why this is so important is because it causes Kaposi sarcoma and AIDS-defining cancer and that it's most commonly spread through blood transmission and sexual contact. And that the way to know you have KS is that you'll see purple lesions in the skin because KS creates new blood vessels in the skin. And so KS is most common in high endemic areas like Africa and Mediterranean countries. 
And so to go in the structure of KSHV, it's a double-stranded DNA virus with three layers enclosing it. The first layer is a protein capsid, and then you have a tegument composed of proteins and viral RNAs. And then the last layer is a lipid bilayer envelope with glycoproteins. And so in the life cycle of KSHV, there are two stages. The first one is latency. And in latency, there's persistent KSHV infection with very few viral gene expression. And that KSHV in the cell in latency is uh, expressed as a, 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 a plasmid. And so in, LAN, in LANA, uh, so the LANA protein is what keeps it persistent in KSHV uh, latency. And that protects it from immunosurveillance like some tumor suppressors like P53 and RB. And that it loads the viral genome on the host genome by means of the N terminal of the LANA protein. And that it maintains viral latency with the C terminal by uh, protecting the cell and KSHV from immunosurveillance and inhibiting RTA, which is the lytic transactivator protein. And so to go from latency to lytic, you have to have a stimuli and some environmental factors that create that switch is oxidative stress, stress or hypoxia. And that uh, during the lytic stage, there are genes are expressed in three stages, immediate, early, early, and late genes. And after all of those genes are expressed, the host cells are lysed and new viral progeny are released from the cell. And so to go into uh, my goal and purpose, we test the effects of three inhibitors UZH1 and STM2457, which are both metal three inhibitors and part of the M6A rider complex. And then the third in, uh, inhibitor is ACBI1, which is an SWI SNF inhibitor and a chromatin remodeling complex. And to give some background to M6A, it's an RNA modification with three groups. The first group is the writers, which add the M6A to the mRNA by adding a methyl group to an adenosine molecule. And then the erasers do the opposite effect of the writers by demethylasing the adenosine molecule. And then the readers are the M6A binding proteins. And most common uh, M6A readers are the YTH family, which uh, do three different functions, splice, mRNA splicing, RNA degradation, and enhancing translation efficiency. And for the SWI SNF complex, it's a chromatin modification. This is much different than M6A because this is a DNA modification while M6A is an RNA modification. And the SWI SNF remodels the chromatin by sliding the DNA around the nucleosome, which makes uh, transcription factors have more room to attach. And so this makes DNA more accessible for transcription, replication, and DNA repair. And so this is my methods and experimental design. So we used an engineered cell line called ISLK RGB BAC16 with three proteins that are able to illuminate their own fluorescent light under a fluorescent microscope. And so for the cell culture, we used a media of DMEM, FBS, and four other antibiotics. And so for the fluorescent microscope, there are three channels, the RFP, GFP, and BFP. The RFP shows the cells in the latent state, and then the GFP and BFP show the cells in the lytic state, and that we're going to count the GFP cells to basically compare uh, the lytic replication. And so before I get to the results, uh, I want to state my hypothesis before uh, I started this experiment. So when I chose the writers, I had a choice between basically choosing inhibitors for the writers or the erasers. So I chose the writers and hope that uh, it would limit, it would uh, decrease lytic replication. And so here are my results. So for the controls, you can see that the negative and positive control are working. And then for the sodium butyrate, you can see that for the one millimolar, there is very few and almost no lytic replication, but the three millimolar sodium butyrate actually has quite a few uh, GFP positive cells. So for induction to test lake replication, we're gonna use three millimolar sodium butyrate and uh, kind of disregard the one millimolar. And so for the results for UZH1, the metal three inhibitor, uh, we took images from day one to day three of post-induction. And so all these images and all the data you will see is from day three. And so here is uh, no sodium butyrate induction. So with just this uh, UZH1, 
there is no lytic replication. And so with the sodium butyrate induction, you can see an increase in GFP positive cells compared to the three millimolar sodium butyrate with the 0.2% DMSO. And that with increasing concentration of UZH1, that the number of GFP positive cells also increase. And then here's the graph that, uh, that confirms the findings. And then this is the second experiment we did. Um, the same results appeared that uh, there are more GFP positive cells compared to the DMSO induction. And that with increasing concentration that uh, GFP positive cells do increase. And then this is for STM2457, another metal three inhibitor. And that you can see there are no GFP positive cells with no sodium butyrate induction. And then if you notice this uh, blue ring right here, that is not a cell, those most likely just an air bubble, so it's uh, not a BFP positive cell. And that you can see this, the same results with the UZH1, but there are more GFP positive cells compared to the three millimolar sodium butyrate with the 0.2% DMSO. And that as the concentration of STM increases, so does the number of GFP positive cells. And then for the second experiment, you can see that the results confirm the first experiment. And then for ACBI1, the SW, SWI SNF inhibitor, they can see again, just like the two other inhibitors, that there is no lytic replication for, the, for day three um, with no sodium butyrate induction. And that the results are the same for both inhibit, for all three inhibitors that there is more GFP positive cells compared to the three millimolar sodium butyrate with the 0.2% DMSO, and then with increasing concentration, the number of GFP positive cells do increase. And that uh, the reason why there is no second experiment data for ACBI1 is because uh, when I conducted it, uh, the results contradict the first experiment. So there's gonna be a needed for a, a, a re, rerun of that experiment. And it's probably due to probably me, honestly. And then for the conclusion that all three inhibitors are not sufficient to induce case HV reactivation, but under sodium butyrate induction, they do enhance case HV lytic replication. And so this gives me the conclusion that M6A and SWSNF complex regulate lytic reactivation and help maintain case HV latency. And so for future directions, we're gonna to need to repeat the experiments, confirm on case HV transcripts, proteins, and virions level. And then we're gonna to have to treat the metal three activators to see if it has the opposite effect. And then here are the people I wanna acknowledge. Um, so my mentor, Wen Meng, uh, my PI, Dr. S.J. Gao, uh, the other members of the Gao Lab who did uh, their part. And then the uh, people running this Hillman Academy, uh, it's a big privilege to be a part of this because to even be a high schooler and have this type of research experiments is something not many people can have. So thank you. Uh, hi everyone, <laughs> me again. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great honor that I can introduce Daniel and Kate, both of them. Uh, so Catherine actually is a very excellent student who have achieved outstanding grades in her science classes. And also he, she received many honors throughout her high school. And she has taken quite a lot biological uh, related classes. And I actually can tell once he joined our lab, uh, she joined our lab that she actually mastered the knowledges and also the experiment skills very well. Um, Catherine um, works very well in groups and she gets along well with all our lab members and also Daniel. <laughs> but also, she is very energetic and ambitious student. She's very eager to learn knowledges and she's committed 
to uh, reach her responsibilities in the science field. But I think Catherine is on her way to achieving a high level of successful academically, but her best qualities is related to her character. Catherine is a very uh, charismatic and trustworthy, and she's very intelligent. I think with the perfect personality that she has, no doubt there is a bright future ahead of her. And oh, one thing more uh, to Daniel and Catherine, you guys are very welcome back to our lab if you have a chance. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your time uh, this Friday. My name is Catherine Maldia. Um, I'm a rising senior at North Allegheny High School. And this summer, I worked with Dr. Gao and Dr. Meng um, on Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus M6A modifiers and how they affect the KSHV life cycle, uh, specifically the switch from uh, latency to the lytic cycle. So, just a bit of background um, KSHV is an oncogenic virus. So this definition signifies that the virus introduces genes into the host genome uh, that are potentially cancer causing. So like other herpes virus strains, uh, the KS KSHV has two distinct life cycles, um, latency and the lytic phase. Um, so the latent phase, the virus's default phase occurs when the virus is existing as an episome or a very small circle of DNA um, tethered to the host's chromosome. Um, and the virus is not actively reproducing or causing an active infection at this time. Um, and the lytic cycle, on the other hand, can be triggered by a number of factors, including oxidative stress, a weakened immune system, or even co-infection with uh, a disease like AIDS or even SARS-CoV-19. Um, and so similar to the way a cold sore might pop up once you're feeling stressed or overtired, uh, a KSHV is an opportunistic virus taking advantage of when your body is at its weakest. So in an active infection, KSHV is hijacking the cell's machinery uh, to produce more copies of itself. So the virus will then lice or kill the cell um, and release new copies. So as you can see on the diagram to the left, um, the latent phase is um, uh, greatly dictated by the LANA or um, latency associated nuclear antigen protein. Um, and the uh, RTA protein is majorly expressed during the lytic phase. So um, active uh, infections of KSHV are associated with a number of different malignancies, including Kaposi sarcoma or PEL, uh, which are two types of cancers, and um, MCD and KICS, which are two other malignancies. Um, so in our lab, the main focus of our study is uh, KS or Kaposi sarcoma. So since the aforementioned life cycle of KSHV requires a shift in which genes may be expressed, the two stages are potentially regulated by nucleic acid meth methylation or mRNA modification. Uh, the most prevalent form of methylation is M6A or uh, N6A methyladenosine. Uh, the proteins that regulate um, such methylation are called writers and erasers. So pretty self-explanatory. Um, writers are the ones that add the uh, M6A modification and erasers are the ones that take it away. So it is thought that uh, writers and erasers manipulate uh, methylation to alter mRNA reading and allow some genes to be read while others are downregulated depending on if the virus uh, is in the lytic cycle or the latent phase. So in my experiments, we inhibited two eraser proteins, uh, FTO and ALKBH5, um, to see what uh, sort of impact their impediment would ensue on the cells. So you're probably thinking, why does all this matter? Um, so although most tumor cells actually are in the latent phase, uh, lytic cells release paracrine signals that produce or that promote tumor genesis, um, specifically cell proliferation and uh, angiogenesis or the production of new blood vessels. Uh, if you remember in Daniel's presentation, um, the, uh, the lesions on the skin or the tumors um, almost look like bruises. It's because there's a lot of blood vessels running through them. Um, and they also replenish uh, latently infected cells with new virus particles. So therefore we can hope that better understanding of what causes the shift in the KSHV life cycle um, 
can help us innovate uh, new ways to treat and prevent a Kaposi sarcoma and uh, KSHV um, associated tumors. So this is our cell line right here at the top. So the letters R, G, B indicate that the cells fluoresce different colors uh, based on different stages of the viral life cycle. So when the cells are in the latent stage, they're um, producing RFP or red fluorescent protein. Um, when they are in the immediately early lytic stage, they're producing GFP or green fluorescent protein. And the late lytic stage is um, BFP. So um, we use three uh, millimolar of um, sodium butrate or NAB to induce the lytic stage because it's an epigenetic modifier. Um, and we tested these four inhibitors. You can see uh, those three inhibitors right there um, inhibited the ALKDH5 protein. And then the inhibitor there, the FB232, um, inhibits F FTO. So um, on the left, you can kind of see our thought process as we're going through this. So we think that by inhibiting um, these two proteins, we're going to increase the amount of M6A modification because we're taking away the protein that takes away that modification. Um, so once we inhibit that, we're gonna see how that affects um, the lytic cycle, lytic replication um, by viewing the number of cells that are producing GFP or BFP, uh, seeing their intensity, seeing how many cells are in that cycle. So our hypothesis um, coming into these experiments was that the in inhibition of eraser proteins would potentially decrease lytic replication. So thinking of big picture, we want to grasp a better understanding of certain triggers or uh, potentially preventative me measures that affect KS tumor formation. And then hopefully this will open the door for new treatments and further research. So looking into our actual experimental design, uh, we would first induce the cells with sodium butrate, uh, adding various concentrations of inhibitors. And then we would observe the cells from days one to three uh, using a fluorescent microscope, seeing uh, what types of uh, proteins were fluorescing. And then we would quantify our data and calculate percentage of GFP positive cells by actually uh, counting the cells and seeing, um, comparing the two pictures with each other. And I'll show you the pictures in a second. So this is our pilot experiment uh, where we used all four inhibitors. So here we have our controls. Um, so we treated the cells with 0.2% uh, DMSO because we used um, this chemical as a solvent uh, when dissolving our drugs. And then as aforementioned, uh, the sodium butrate was used to induce the cells. And then we used a combination of sodium butrate, DMSO. And then at the very bottom, uh, we have our positive control, which is one millimolar of sodium butrate. Uh, one millimolar of docs, and we knew that this would induce the cells and cause really big reactions. So we wanted to see um, uh, how this compared to other um, other cell lines. So first, we uh, tested the cells without inducing them, without adding the sodium butrate, uh, to ensure that the, inhibit the inhibitors themselves cannot actually induce the lytic phase. So as you can see, there's no GFP, there's no BFP production. Um, so this indicates no lytic reproduction. So the same is true for the other two drugs at both concentrations. Um, I don't know if you can see, it's a little bit harder to see on the screen. Um, in the C3 uh, 500 micromolar uh, BFP column, there's a little bit of um, BFP production. We're not actually sure why this happened. We think it was a bit of a fluke with a specific experiment, um, but this is just an unusual occurrence. And then here we have our actual induced cells where we did add the sodium butrate. Um, here's the first inhibitor, which is FB23-2. Um, and then we have various different uh, concentrations um, of one uh, micromolar and four micromolar. And then on the very right, you can see our um, quantification of the data in that chart over there. So uh, as the um, concentration of our inhibitor is increasing, the amount of cells that are um, entering the lytic phase is decreasing. And then the same is true for our other drug, which is C6. Um, we see a bit of an increase of uh, the 20 micro, uh, micromolar, and then uh, at 100 micromolar, we see that 
pretty substantial decrease in lytic replication. So the other two drugs, on the other hand, we didn't see too much of a difference um, in the lower concentration. And then we got to the higher concentration. We noticed um, quite a bit of cell toxicity and the cells were actually dying. Um, you can see it's very clear uh, in C3 that we don't see uh, almost any cells at all because um, uh, they're all unfortunately have died. Um, so in our neck experiment, we decided against using these two drugs because um, we didn't see that much of an effect on the cells uh, in any um, substantial way. Uh, and this is our second experiment. Uh, this, is from, this is data from day three. And we just use FB23 and C6. So as you can see on the quantification to the right, um, a repeat of our results from the past uh, experiment where we're seeing as the concentration uh, increases, uh, we're seeing a decrease in lytic replication. And again, uh, in the same way, we're seeing a decrease again uh, when we quantify these two cells. So in conclusion, we supported our hypothesis that uh, eraser inhibition could potentially have a negative effect on the KFHV lytic cycle. So further research might include a repeat of our experiment to ensure the validity of our results, perhaps a rundown on KSHV trial viral transcript protein and virions level. And we also, um, we also want to clarify what genes are being affected by the FGO and ALK VH5 inhibition. Uh, and we wanna pinpoint the cellular mechanism in place um, and kind of see what, is, um, what exactly is going on, uh, what factors are at play. A uh, big thank you to everyone. Uh, Dr. Gao, Dr. Meng, Dr. Galson, Dr. Sen, Andrew, um, Dr. Boone, um, Stephen, and Solomon. Um, this has been such an amazing summer. I definitely had the coolest summer job out of all my friends. So um, I really, I really enjoyed my time here, and I, I'm so grateful for um, for my experience. But thank you again. Okay, next up is Gibran, and he's he sure let me get slides that better working. Yep. Good morning, everyone. I'm Krishna Singh from Sivindra Singh Lab. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Gibran Rahman. Uh, I was his mentor during this summer program. And uh, Gibran was involved in the, our ongoing research pro project. So we are actually working on the uh, effect of uh, small molecule inhibitors and the metabolic alteration associated with prostate cancer development and metastasis. So Gibran was involved in one of our uh, project uh, he work on the phytochemical sulforaphane, and he looks its effect on the uh, fatty acid metabolism. Uh, so although he did not have the prior uh, lab experience, but he uh, did a really great job, and he was very enthusiastically uh, involved in the reading research article, uh, doing experiment, and, uh, and I hope uh, what he learned during the summer program uh, will help to pursue his career goal. And uh, overall, I found that Gibran is a really very humble uh, student, and uh, his hobby is, uh, is uh, playing soccer game, uh, reading books, and uh, listening music. And uh, I had really great time to work with Gibran, and uh, uh, now he's going to present what he learned during this program. And so please welcome Gibran. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gibran Rahman, and I will be presenting my project, uh, The Effect of Sulforaphane on Expression and Activity of mono -A glycerol lipase in Prostate Cancer. Um, I was mentored by Dr. Krishna Beer Singh and Dr. Shivandra Singh's lab. And yes, that is a picture of broccoli. 
Um, so before I start, just a little bit of background about prostate cancer. Um, it is a carcinoma of the prostate, which is a gland in the male reproductive system. Um, this research is important because prostate cancer is the most common cancer um, in males in the United States. Um, approximately 80 to 90 percent of prostate cancers are um, dependent of androgen at the initial diagnosis. Uh, androgen is a group of sex hormones. Um, and then the last bullet point there, it says alterations in fatty acid metabolism is a unique feature of prostate cancer. And that is really the basis of this project. Um, so before I start, what is sulforaphane? It is a plant-derived phytochemical from broccoli stems and Brussels sprouts, which explains the picture of broccoli. Um, the reason we're using this is because it has uh, already shown in prior research that there is a chemopreventative effect in in vivo and in vitro prostate cancer models. Um, and again, it inhibits fatty acid synthesis in prostate cancer. Um, and since the fatty acid process is unique to prostate cancer, we want to see how sulforaphane will affect our uh, protein of interest expression. And our protein of interest is uh, monoglycerol lipase. So this is an enzyme that's involved in the breakdown of lipid droplets. And it, again, it is already known that it is involved in the prostate cancer initiation and development. Um, and the reason that we're using it is um, it's already known that it supports malignancy by breaking down lipid droplets uh, into free fatty acids. Um, so we can take these two pieces of information. Uh, we know that sulforaphane is known to inhibit fatty acid synthesis. So we wanna see, does the drug have an effect on the expression of the protein? So uh, when we were starting this project, uh, we started with the first question, what is the effect of sulforaphane on prostate cancer cell metabolism? And through talking it out, we uh, made a more detailed question. Uh, how do different concentrations of sulforaphane affect the development of prostate cancer? Um, and then on the bottom right, it says uh, why the study was designed. So we want to see if the correlation of the C-MIC oncogene and the monoglycerol lipase uh, protein expression uh, in prostate cancer, if that's affected by the drug sulforaphane. So one of the first things we did was uh, the immunohistochemistry lab protocol. Um, I don't expect you to read all this, but I did want to put uh, the method on here just so you guys can see what I was actually doing in the lab. I did summarize it into five steps. Uh, so we have a deparinophization step, a dehydration step, an antigen retrieval step, a step for blocking antibody incubation and counterstaining, and then lastly, uh, dehydration and mounting. Um, so by the end of this, we got our result, which looked like this. And what this tells us, well, first of all, on the left, that is a wild type mouse. And on the right, it's a high MIC mouse, which means that there is an overexpression of the oncogene MIC. Um, and what this told us was that there is a positive correlation between the oncogene C MIC and the monoglycerol lipase in prostate cancer. So the purple dots are uh, cell nuclei. And on you can see how the, there's not really any color on the left image. So the reason that there is more brown on the right image is because that's where the monoglycerol lipase is actually being expressed. So that's how we know that there is a positive correlation. Um, okay, so uh, another thing we did was we used uh, programs on the lab computers uh, to do some molecular docking to see how uh, monoglycerol lipase and sulforaphane actually bond to each other. So on the left, uh, you can see the whole complex. And monoglycerol lipase is much bigger than sulforaphane. Um, as you can see in the red circle, uh, that is sulforaphane. So if we enlarge that, that's the picture on the right. And that's the molecule of sulforaphane. It bonds to uh, monoglycerol lipase in two spots. And if you're wondering what the purple and the green is, that's just the hydrogen forces that the program showed us. So it can show us the hydrogen donors and acceptors. Um, so I thought this was really cool that we can actually see this with our own eyes, um, but not like the real thing, just on a computer, so. <laughs> um, okay, 
uh, we were looking at two groups of mice, normal and cancerous. And then within these mice, uh, we looked at the prostate glands uh, for three different time stages. So we have uh, uh, mice of five weeks of age, 10 weeks, and 25 weeks of age. And we studied the prostate glands of these mice to see where the, there is more or less expression of the monoglycerol lipase, um, which again, that was what the immunohistochemistry lab protocol told us. And we applied this to one prostate cancer cell line uh, for humans, obviously. Um, this is called PC3. And the reason that we picked this cell line is because it is a very aggressive type of cancer. Um, it is hormone negative. So if you remember at the beginning, I said that 80 to 90% of prostate cancers were androgen dependent. Um, that makes it much easier to treat. Um, this is hormone negative, which means that it's much harder to treat. And it also metastasizes very quickly. Um, which is why we picked it for our research project. So again, I don't expect you to read all this, but this was um, our method for immunoblotting, otherwise known as Western blotting. And the reason that we did this is because it showed us that the inhibition of the monoglycerol lipase protein expression by the sulforaphane treatment in the PC3 human prostate cancer cells. And um, what we got from this was this, and here, I can actually show you numbers that our drug is working. So on the right, um, we have three different time stages uh, for our treatment. We have six hours, uh, treatment at 12 hours and treatment at 24 hours. And we also have, for each of those time stages, we have three concentrations, uh, zero micromolars, five and 10. So for six hours, there really wasn't uh, any change, but for 12 and 24, you can see the numbers highlighted in red that the monoglycerol lipase expression actually decreased as the sulforaphane uh, concentration increased. Um, so again, this shows us that there is a correlation between the increase in sulforaphane and the decrease in monoglycerol lipase expression. And this can lead us to our conclusion. So we can use our immunohistochemistry analysis, uh, prior research and our Western blot analysis to come to the final conclusion. Since monoglycerol lipase is known to be associated with the growth and metastasis of prostate cancer, sulforaphane possibly prevents prostate cancer growth through inhibition of monoglycerol lipase expression. Um, although that was it for my project, that is not all that I learned, and that's really what the purpose of this program is. I learned a lot about lab protocols and safety. I've learned numerous uh, lab methods and techniques that some weren't even used in my project. Um, DNA and protein electrophoresis, uh, immunoblotting. I've used a hemocytometer to conduct multiple cell counts. Um, I've done RNA isolation and obviously the immunohistochemistry. I've learned a lot of information and basics regarding cell culture. I have a much better understanding of how research works as a whole, and obviously a much better understanding of how cancer works, specifically prostate and breast cancer, because that's what the same lab, uh, the lab that I work in, specializes in. And that's just what I learned in the lab. I've learned a lot more in these last six weeks. And I really can't thank these people enough. I would like to give a special thanks to my mentor, Dr. Krishna Beer Singh. Um, I'd like to also thank Dr. Ham or Lisa, uh, Dr. Kim uh, Sivu Parmanthan, Dr. Shivandra Singh, the lab PI, uh, and the Singh lab as a whole. Um, also, thank you, Dr. Gallison, Andrew, and Dr. Malabika Sen, and Cancer Biology Psych Group. Uh, just for making it like a very fun group and like easy to work in and be comfortable in. Um, and then lastly, I would like to thank Dr. David Boone, Solomon Lifshitz, Stephen Jones, and the Hillman Research Program for this amazing opportunity for these last six weeks. And yeah, if there are any questions, um, free to ask them.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kaylee Irvine, and I am a PhD student in Dr. Lynn Zhang's lab, where Audrey worked with us this summer. So it's my pleasure to introduce her this morning. Uh, Audrey will be a senior this fall at Avonworth High School. There, she's a member of the National Honor Society as well as the National Arts Honor Society. And outside of school, she's a member of a women's club hockey team. After graduation, she plans to attend college to major in one of the biological sciences and eventually helps to become a pathologist. So I had the privilege of being Audrey's secondary mentor this past summer. Um, and I've learned that Audrey is a very inquisitive person, always eager to learn and full of great questions. So our lab focuses on anti-cancer therapy induced cell death in colorectal cancer. So Audrey worked on a combination treatment using a targeted therapy that's used in the clinic to treat colorectal cancer with a BET degrader, which she'll be telling you more about. Um, so thank you, Audrey, for all of your hard work this summer. We really enjoyed having you in the lab. And with that, we're all excited to hear your talk. Okay. Um, so my main focus was the effects of the drugs uh, rigorefinib and that degrader 260 on specifically the cell lines of HCT116. So like she said, um, our main focus in our lab is colorectal cancer. And so this cancer often forms in um, colon or rectum or the large intestines. It is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States. And treatments often include chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. So the first drug that I'm going to introduce is uh, rigorefinib. This is a multi-kinase inhibitor. Um, it is approved for treating solid tumors, including colorectal cancer, and has been proven to have many anti-cancer um, effects associated with the induction of apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So with regrefinib, um, oftentimes it can become resistant during targeted cancer treatment. So we wanted to see if the use of targeting beet, um, BET protein uh, can amplify the effects of regrefinib. So BET proteins are bromodomain and extra terminal domain uh, family proteins. These are epigenetic readers and they, um, they are, uh, they fuel tumor genes and are oftentimes like a big supplier of tumor gene survival. So targeting the BET family proteins has emerged as a promising anti-cancer strategy. And using BET inhibitors has shows, shown um, efficiency against a variety of different tumors. So the problem with uh, BET inhibitors is it oftentimes shows efficiency towards, um, against, against a variety of different tumors, but it is generally ineffective as a single agent. So the um, BET degraders are synthesized using BET inhibitors and an E3 ubiquitin ligase binder, which um, is a degrader using per, um, pertismal degraders. And this will inhibit and degrade the targeted protein in this case, that being BET proteins. So the BET degrader is oftentimes more effective in suppressing cancer cell growth than the BET inhibitors, which is why we chose the drug um, BET degrader D260. So our hypothesis was using the combination of regrefinib and uh, BET D260, we can create a synergistic effect to induce more apoptosis and is a more promising anti-cancer treatment than um, either drug alone for colorectal cancer. So to begin, we utilize the cell line of HCT116, which is colorectal cancer in adult males. Um, we used a variety of different con drug concentrations of rigorefinib, uh, BET degrader, and the combination of the two. And to figure out the ideal concentrations, we used an MTS assay. So this is the result of our MTS assay, which was explained earlier is um, you will put the cells into a 96 well plate with different dosages and then um, put it into the um, MTS machine and it will uh, show the different concentrations and what the cell proliferation is. 
So the IC50 is um, how much the inhibitor, in this case being the drugs, inhibits um, the cells to 50%. So for rigorefinib, it is around nine micromolars, um, D260.6, and then the combination being the least, which means it's the most toxic towards cancer cells. So to sort of visualize um, what this would look like on cells, we used crystal violet assay. Um, we plated these cells in a 12 row plate. And as you can see in the control group, which was untreated, um, it's very dark showing that there's the most amount of cells. And then we have this very nice gradient showing that in the combination treatment, um, there's the least amount of cells. So to sort of prove that apoptosis is occurring, because we want to just see that um, the, or the cells are choosing this pathway over just, you know, dying off over time, um, we use flow cytometry assay. And in these graphs, um, you can see along this line is the early stages of apoptosis. And then the y-axis would be the late stages. So in the control group, you can see there's very few cells in this quadrant, which is the early apoptosis. And then as we move along, you see that there is much more occurring in the early apoptosis quadrant and the late apoptosis quadrant. And then to, to further um, prove this point, we made a graph showing the apoptosis rate and the combination treatment is much, much higher than um, any of the other two treatments. So to um, show the molec what molecularly is happening, um, we wanted to do a Western blot, which basically takes a pictures of certain proteins that we wanted to highlight. Um, the proteins we wanted to highlight was P53, Puma, and caspase. These three all indicate apoptosis. And once again, we have a very nice gradient with our control group being the lightest to our combination group being the darkest. So the darkness will show that there's more P53, more Puma, and more caspase occurring. That all is proving that these proteins are um, being expressed and showing apoptosis. And then the actin at the bottom is just a control to see that we, um, we use the same amount of protein in each of the wells. To conclude everything, we wanted to see um, if the inhibition of one of our apoptosis proteins, um, if that was inhibited, what the effects would be. So we used SI Puma, which temporarily inhibits the expression of Puma, and we could see that there are the, the cells are clearly darker than whenever you're um, than the normal assay. So whenever Puma is inhibited, less apoptosis is occurring, showing that this protein is crucial in um, apoptosis in this drug treatment. So to conclude, um, we saw a synergistic effect in an increased apoptosis in our combination treatment which was our ultimate goal. Um, we could prove this by showing that P53, Puma, and Caspase were significantly upregulated in our combination group. And a knockdown of Puma can block apoptosis in our combination group. And then to conclude all of this, um, a combination of rigorefinib and bet d 260 is a promising treatment for colorectal cancer. So our future plans with these, um, with this data, um, further testing on the dependence of P53 and Puma proteins by the use of knockout cell lines. So we had created, um, the, um, we created lots of cell lines that were resistant to um, the BET degrader, but it takes a long time to sort of grow those cells because you have to treat them and then wait a couple of weeks and then treat them again. So we ended up not being able to plate those or test any of them. But in the future, um, with those bet degrader resistant cells, we could use the combination treatment to restore sensitivity and then use the methods that we used earlier, such as the MTS, Western plot, and the flow cytometry to see if the same amount of apoptosis has occurred. So um, my acknowledgements, thank you to Susu Howe, who was my uh, main mentor 
uh, Lin Zhang for welcoming, welcoming me into the lab, Kaylee for helping me out, and um, all of my um, site heads at the cancer biology site. And thank you to the Hellman Academy for giving me this wonderful um, opportunity. Okay, so next up is Maria. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kurt Weiss. I uh, direct the musculoskeletal oncology lab um, over at the Hillman and uh, had the privilege of working with Maria Salvaggio this summer. Maria is a rising senior at uh, Swickley Academy where she's uh, a star tennis player and she has taken every uh, math class that they have and some that they don't have. Um, so uh, to be quite honest with you, Maria came into our lab under not awesome circumstances. On the 10th of this month, we physically moved the lab from Bridgeside Point 2 here uh, to the cancer center down the street. We've had some uh, big personnel changes uh, recently. So I thought, you know, geez, maybe this isn't a great time to have a Hillman student. But uh, thankfully, uh, in science, uh, you can't plan everything. And that's probably a good thing. Uh, Maria uh, came to join us, and by virtue of her uh, mathematical awesomeness, which you're going to hear all about, um, she really, really, really helped us with some data analysis, um, and also in the operating room on, on the study she's going to talk about. And uh, we just put this in for a uh, $2.5 million DOD grant on, on Tuesday. So if we get that, uh, we have Maria to thank. And... Um, and that's not just lip service. She really, really, really helped us out. And uh, also, uh, Doctor, got to give a shout out to Dr. Brenda Deergard, who um, helped Maria see really how the sausage gets made when you're working with uh, rare cancers like sarcomas. I'm really excited about all the sarcoma talks today. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Deb, thank you for putting on the Summer Academy. I don't think any of us appreciates how much work it takes, uh, other than it's a ton and you don't get thanked as much as you should. Um, uh, I want to thank my, my lab, uh, Tanya, Matt, um, uh, Brittany Royce, who's not here right now. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. and Mrs. Silvaggio for having such a great kid. And uh, most of all, uh, Maria, um, fantastic, incredible attitude. The answer is always yes, always upbeat, always positive. What can I do? And uh, uh, if I'm lucky, Maria will be my boss someday. So Maria, Tanya, anything to add? Good, good, all right. Maria, thank you. All right, so hi, my name is Maria and over the summer I've been working in Dr. Weiss's lab. So the main focus of our lab is sarcomas, which are cancers of the bone and soft tissue. And there's over 50 different subtypes of sarcoma, which each respond a little bit differently to treatments like chemo and radiation. So if this is a less common cancer, why are we studying it? So sarcomas have a pattern of metastasis to the lung. And if a patient's sarcoma has spread to the lung, they have at best a 30% chance of survival. So obviously our goal is to discover novel methods to increase these odds and improve patient quality of life by decreasing the chance of their tumor spreading or coming back. So one of the most important parts of tumor removal surgery is removing the tumor with negative margins. So what this means is when a tumor is removed, you want to remove the tumor with a border of normal tissue around it. And removing a tumor in this way helps prevent any residual tumor from remaining in the patient and decreases the chance of the cancer coming back or having any local recurrence. But this is where a problem arises. It's, it's very difficult to assess margins. There's two inoperative methods of assessing margins, one of which is the subjective opinion of how well the surgeon thinks that they did. And the other method involves sending small frozen sections of the tumor to pathology, 
who will analyze the samples and determine margin. But we're, th thing we're thinking that these frozen sections might not account for the entirety of your tumor. So this is where endocyanin green dye, which we refer to as ICG, comes in. So ICG is a fluorescent dye that's been used in many other clinical settings. And so what we've observed about ICG so far is that in normal blood vessels, ICG is flushed out of your body fairly quickly with a half-life of around five minutes or so, but tumors don't have these normal blood vessels. And tumors can actually generate their own blood vessels to get the blood supply that they need. But these blood vessels are structurally weaker um, from the, our body's regular blood vessels. So from our observations of ICG, we've hypothesized that in areas um, of disrupted vasculature, ICG may leak into the affected tissue and accumulate there. And since blood vessels and tumors are abnormal, the dye would remain in the body system there for a longer period of time. So this is how tumors are identified under ICG imaging. And this was originally seen in a clinical study involving metatastic sarcoma samples in mice. So in this preclinical study, ICG was used to identify tumor margins and remove the tumor with negative margins in surgeries in mice in vivo. So in the first image, you can see it circled. That's what the tumor in the mouse looks like in the leg there. And then in the second photo, that's after using the ICG to remove the tumor from the mouse. So after seeing this mouse study, we were thinking, what if we could use ICG in human patients to help identify margins? So our research question quickly became, can ICG be used to assess sarcoma margins interoperatively to enhance surgeons in removing the tumor as completely as possible? So we so far, we have enrolled around 26 patients in our clinical proof of concept trial. And for each ICG case, um, we have patients arrive early so that the ICG has enough time to infuse. So previously, each patient was administered two and a half milligrams per kilogram of ICG dye, but this number has since been decreased to two milligrams per kilogram due to oversaturation of the dye. So using a benchmark sent by another study involving ICG in breast cancer, regions of the tumor bed that showed greater than or equal to 77 percent fluorescence compared to the tumor reference point were assumed to contain residual tumor and surgical margins would be declared positive. So if your fluorescence in the tumor bed was less than that, you would have negative margins. So if the ICG tumor margin analysis aligns with that of final pathology, that's saying that your ICG worked, that it was successful. So, and we have three surgeons on our team right now, Dr. Kurt Weiss, Dr. Stella Lee, and Dr. Richard McGow. So prior to our surgery, what our team does is we go in and we prepared the striker tower, which has our SPY portable handheld imaging system that we'll use to image. And then during surgery, we'll wait until the tumor's removed to actually go in and image. So before I pull it up, I just wanna say that there is gonna be a tumor on screen. So if anyone's uncomfortable, feel free to look away. So this is what it looks like after it's removed. And so this is what it looks like on our imaging system. As you can see, what we're trying to look at is that really green, really bright, really concentrated part of the tumor. That's where we're setting our reference point once we see that. We set that as our zero, and then we'll go into the tumor bed, and that's what we'll compare using that 77% reference as our threshold. And then after this, we give a little survey to our surgeons asking, hey, how do you think you did? Do you think you removed it with positive or negative margins? And surgeons are completely blind to ICG, so it doesn't affect how they rank everything. So in addition to our intraoperative methods, we also did a lot of data analysis. Um, so what we did was when looking at our data, we used a system of zeros and ones when we were recording. So ICG results that matched that of pathology were given a one and considered successful. And those that did not match were given a zero considered unsuccessful. So using final pathology kind of as our marker, the accuracy of ICG was determined. And then we did sensitivity and specificity tests as well. So I also thought it would be important to consider an outside factor that could be impacting ICG. So I chose to focus on time because different drugs take different drugs or different dyes take different amounts of time to infuse. So to do this, I calculated again, specificity, sensitivity, and then I ran a logistic regression test, which I'll explain in a little bit. So sensitivity refers to how well your particular test can detect if a patient is positive. So in this case, how well ICG can detect positive margins and specificity is how well a certain test can predict if a patient is negative. So if ICG has negative margins. And then a logistic regression test is a particular statistical test that compares binary data. So in this case, if ICG worked, if ICG didn't work versus an independent variable, which in this case was time. And what logistic regression is gonna tell you if your data is statistically significant or not. So out of our 26 cases, we had to take four out because they either lacked data or the final pathology results weren't back yet. And out of the 22 that we looked at, ICG correctly predicted margins for 13 of the cases for an accuracy of 59%. So looking at timing out of our 22 cases, 
12 of them, there was greater than or equal to two and a half hours between the start of our infusion and the time of the first incision. And then there were nine patients who had less than two and a half hours. Um, and before we shift slides, I also thought I would include some of our imaging photos. So again, tumor, if you want to look away. Um, so the two pictures on the board, on the outsides are of our tumors. And then in the middle, you have a tumor bed. So the photo, okay, it's on the far right. This is one of our earliest cases. It's also one of our biggest tumors. This was from the right thigh. And then in the middle, you see the soft tumor tissue bed. It's near the tibia, one of our most recent cases. And then the last photo, it's from a tumor and taken from the right knee. So this is kind of what we would look at in the OR. So overall, our sensitivity was 29% and our specificity was 91. And then when you break it down, looking at the time groups for the greater and that are equal to two and a half hour group, accuracy was 75, sensitivity was 40, and specificity was 100. And then for the less than two and a half hours, accuracy of 44, sensitivity of 17, and specificity of 100. And then you can see the results, obviously, in this bar graph here. And then when we ran our logistic regression test, it can be summarized in this graph here. And we got a p-value of 0.352. Now, since 0.352 is greater than 0.05, which is kind of the gold standard for statistical significance, it is not statistically significant as of this moment. Now, what does this mean? So obviously, you want to have as high of an accuracy, sensitivity, or specificity as possible to say ICG can correctly predict both positive and negative margins. But specifically, we want to have a high sensitivity because sensitivity is looking at positive cases and you don't want to send a patient away saying, hey, we got all of the tumor out when in reality there's still some left. That's not safe for the patient. So we want to have a particularly high sensitivity. So even though it's not statistically significant as of yet, it is important to note that in the group that had greater than or equal to two and a half hours between the start of incision and the first, or start of infusion and the first incision, the accuracy and the sensitivity were highest in those groups and they were lowest in the groups where it was less than two and a half hours. So that's important to note. It's also important to acknowledge some sources of error that may have happened. So first of all, sarcomas again, are very rare. So we're gonna have a very small sample size. It's hard to achieve statistical significance with a small sample size. Um, and the tumor was imaged by different people throughout the study. So it might've been imaged a little bit differently. And then also, as I mentioned, over 50 subtypes, ICG might react a little bit differently in those different subtypes. That's something we have to keep looking at. So our next steps, our biggest priority is to continue enrolling patients. We originally called for about 110 on our protocol. So we want to get around 50, 75 more, keep looking at data. And then we also wanted to modify our protocol a little bit in the OR just to figure out what time we were actually imaging the tumor. So then we can paint a better picture of how long has the dye been in the patient when we are looking at the tumor and we're collecting our data. And then keeping on considering factors that may be affecting ICG. So example, if the patient has had prior radiation, if a patient um, has had prior chemo or how big the tumor is. So just all those different factors. So I have a lot of people to thank. I could not imagine this summer being as amazing as it was without everyone in my lab. So Dr. Weiss, Tanya, Dr. Gong, and Brittany, um, all of the biostatistics help that I got from Dr. Deergard and Dr. Lee, obviously our surgical team. So Dr. Lee, Dr. Weiss, Dr. McGow, Stryker for giving us our tower and our dye. And then also all of our CB heads. So Dr. Gallison, Andrew, and Dr. Sen. And then obviously Dr. Boone, Stephen, and Solomon. They did a really amazing job. And I could not imagine having a more amazing summer experience. So yes, thank you. OK, so we have one more talk, and then we will have a break. So Donovan, you're up. Let me get. It's because I moved the two screens. It's set up for two screens. Well, that was it. But bear with me. I got to figure out what to do. Okay. Do this. Share. Hi, my name is uh, John Schmitz. Um, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Topeka Wanikoko and myself had the pleasure of uh, mentoring Donovan Allen this, uh, this summer. Um, Donovan is a rising senior at Central Catholic. And when he's not worried about how many AP classes he really needs to take his senior year, <laughs> he's an accomplished pianist. He, he spends hours every night irritating his parents and his brother with, you know, Beethoven sonatas and Chopin etudes. And then he goes off and practices Muay Thai, which is a form of Thai boxing. So very energetic, very smart. He's, he wants to combine his interest in science and writing so that he can work primarily in activism in public health. That's what he currently says. So, so with, with that short intro. Hi, so I was just introduced my name is Donovan Allen. Uh, my project was on novel drug combinations for the treatment of small cell lung cancer. So just a short introduction on what small cell lung cancer is. It makes up about 15% of all lung cancer cases. Um, it spreads quickly and aggressively, what we would call metastasis in the lab. Um, it almost always returns after treatment with, with a resistance to the previous drug that was used. Um, it's most common in smokers and of the people that are diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, only about 6% will survive five years. So with that being said, clearly there's a need for new treatments for small cell lung cancer, um, which is why we're looking at pole like kinase one or PLK one, because no one wants to say pole like kinase. Um, preliminary data from the lab shows that small cell lung cancer is sensitive to PLK one inhibition. Um, in small cell lung cancer, this particular protein is overexpressed, which leads to its rapid proliferation. Um, pole like kinase is heavily involved in regulating cell processes. Um, as you can see in the diagram, it's involved in centrism, maturation, spindle assembly, and other um, protein pathways. On Vantertib, a PLK1 inhibitor is of interest for the lab for the reason that small cell lung cancer is sensitive to PLK1 inhibition. On Vantertib is a selective PLK1 inhibitor, meaning that it only targets this protein and not others. It has been used in treatments for other cancers and its safety is documented, um, but it has not really been used to treat small cell lung cancer um, in very many cases. So our question is, can it be used to treat small cell lung cancer? Now we use the DMS273 cell line, that's a small cell lung cancer cell line, and we treated it with onvantatib at various concentrations. And um, we look, looked at a Western blot at various time points after treatment. So here you can see that PLK1 is inhibited. Um, later on, the inhibition stops, but apoptosis is still generated, which you can see through the P histone 3 and the PTCTP proteins. So we do know that onvantertib can treat small cell lung cancer, but the issue is that single drug treatments are almost never effective for this particular cancer. So our question is, can synergy be achieved between multiple small cell lung cancer drugs? Our hypothesis is that using onvantertib in combination with other chemotherapeutic agents will enhance its cytotoxicity. As I said before, our model is DMS273. It's a small cell lung cancer cell line. As for our methods, that's a lot of writing, but I'll try to simplify it. Um, DMS273 was played in 90 cell, 96 well plates. Um, we determined the IC50, which is the um, concentration of drug at which 50% of cells die. That was determined for each of the drugs in this study, although the main drug was on Vantertib. And on the following day, on Vantertib was added in combination with several other drugs. After that, the cells were played in six well plates and various drug concentrations were added then as well. After various times, the cells were harvested and processed for Western blot analysis. So as I said before, we tested various drugs. This is one of them um, on Vantertib with a drug called Bay 189, or Bayer 189-5344. That's a lot. 
But um, unfortunately, this drug was not effective in, in um, combination. The synergy between them is generally antagonistic, which means they don't work well together. As you can see in the graph um, on Vantertin in black and there in green in the combination in blue, while they all do decrease cell proliferation, there's not a synergy between them. The same could be said with this drug, which is called Lubronecadin. It's a DNA binder. Um, the relationship was mostly antagonistic still. Unfortunately, many of the drugs that we tested were ineffective in improving on cancer tip. Um, this is a test of AZD6738, an ATR inhibitor, and that was also ineffective. But thankfully, there was at least one drug that it shows promise with, which is called paclitaxel. Um, this, as you can see here, the effect when you can, um, combine them is additive, meaning that they do work well together. And there is also some synergy between them, which is like a multiplicative effect. As you can see on Vantertib in black, paclitaxel in brown, and on Vantertib plus paclitaxel in blue, the cell proliferation rate is steeply decreased in comparison with the two individual drugs. A Western plot was performed to see how exactly the cells are dying or why they're not proliferating. And as you can see, this protein that we call PARP is a measure of cell apoptosis. When PARP is cleaved, you can see that apoptosis is induced in the cell, which happens with um, each of the drugs, but also it happens more significantly when they're in combination together. So based on that, we can conclude that Omphansertib's efficacy can be increased using combinations. It's able to influence the PLK1 pathway of small cell lung cancer and induce apoptosis. But when used in combination with paclitaxel, its efficacy is increased. Further um, studies in mouse models will be conducted to investigate this efficacy further. Acknowledgements, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. John Smiths, for helping me uh, every day in the lab. Um, Dr. Tofik Awanikoko for allowing me to be in the lab. Abby, our lab tech, who was very helpful with my Western blots. Um, Dr. Galson, Dr. Sen, and Andrew um, at the Hillman site. Uh, and Dr. David, Ben, Stephen, and Solomon. Thank you so much. So we're running a little ahead. So before we break, if anybody wants to ask questions of any of our first morning speakers or say anything about them at all, you can do that now. Otherwise, we are going to break. We're supposed to be back at 1045. Uh, I want to sort of stay on that schedule, even though we're running a little ahead, because there are people who will be zooming in for a particular time. So we don't want to get them off schedule. Um, so we're going to take a break. and. Um, there should hopefully still be some donuts and, or muffins and coffee and juice and water outside. Um, and stretch your legs, find the bathrooms. I don't know where they are. <laughs> it's only my second time in this building. Um, and uh, take a little break, stretch your legs, breathe a little, go outside. Welcoming you all back. And um, first up is going to be uh, Daniel Wang and his introducer. Yeah, so um, thank you for inviting me to introduce uh, my home and academy students, uh, Daniel Wang. I am Catherine DiManolis, a faculty member at 
the Hillman Cancer Center and a member of the Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention Program. Daniel is a rising senior at Off Chapel High School, and he was especially interested in learning more about clinical cancer care, cancer treatments, and cancer diagnosis. This is my first year as a Hillman Academy mentor, and I was excited to have Daniel work with me to help launch our analyses examining the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on cancer diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis using data from the UPMC Cancer Network Registry. And this registry includes all patients, data from patients diagnosed at any UPMC facility in Pennsylvania. And so while he did not expect to work on a data-focused project this summer, he said it was a valuable experience to see how we can use existing data to conduct and answer important scientific questions. Daniel chose to focus on prostate cancer, given that he noticed that there were very few studies that have examined the impact of the pandemic on its diagnosis, especially since this is one of the most common cancers diagnosed in men, and that many racial and socioeconomic disparities related to its diagnosis and prognosis may have been exacerbated during the pandemic. I am very impressed with what Daniel was able to accomplish this summer, conducting literature reviews, learning our programming, and conducting preliminary analyses of these data. It is my pleasure to introduce this presentation, and I'm excited to listen to his talk on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on prostate cancer diagnosis. Thank you. So my project is focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on the the lockdown on prostate care diagnosis. So prostate cancer is the most prevalent cancer diagnosed in men, about one in nine chance. And it occurs most commonly in men over 65, which also happens to be the range where COVID is most um, deadly for seniors. And early detection is crucial for more positive prognosis. And one in 39 men will die from prostate cancer that are diagnosed, and this is a relatively low death rate. But black men are also more likely to get it than white men. And you can see from the figure I have in the corner. And the death rate is also almost double for black men than for white. And these um, racial inequalities could be found from genetic factors, um, social factors, or access to healthcare. So cancer care was primarily disrupted during the pandemic due to government imposed lockdowns, patients' concerns of exposure to COVID because they wouldn't want to go to hospitals, and allocation of resources as hospitals were more focused on providing COVID care than cancer care. And during my reading of prior studies, we found for mostly European populations that fewer cancer diagnoses were found during the pandemic. A Croatian study actually found that a three-month delay to diagnosis led to a decrease in overall survival in breast cancer. And skin cancer studies show that some tumors are likely to be diagnosed at much later stages during the pandemic. And a delay in diagnosis and more deadly tumors are also bad for the prognoses. Hospital care in Europe may not be transferable to Latin America because universal health care is common many of the countries, and they have different cultural and governmental responses to the pandemic. Also, the US population is more diverse, so we do not know if cancer patient populations may have been affected disproportionately by the COVID-19 pandemic. So our main goal was to determine the extent to which patient-related factors and tumor-related factors differ between our two um, time frames. So the first one is the pre-pandemic frame, and we use that as the control group. And our exposure group is the pandemic range, which is March 2020 onward when the pandemic was 40 in the US. So we use the UPMC network cancer registry to get data for approximately 1,400 patients. And we use like basic statistical statistical um, analyses such as p-tests and chi-square tests just to see the association in patient-related characteristics, treatments, and tumor factors. So because the US is more diverse and we wanted to see if certain categories were more affected, we split strata into black, white strata and urban and rural residents. So this is a general um, summary of all of the data collected. The left table 
shows the patient characteristics, so just age, demographics, tobacco use, family history of cancer, while the right graph shows the treatments they got. So jumping to the statistic, the significant value, we see that the patients during the pandemic who were diagnosed had approximately a 6% more chance of having a family history of prostate cancer than those before. And something important to mention is that for the county, we also saw about a 6% increase in rural patients than before. And we could most likely attribute this because the rural hospitals were less crowded than the urban ones and people didn't want to like risk exposure to COVID. On the treatment side, we see that none of the values are significant, which is good because this shows that generally the treatments for the pre-pandemic group and the pandemic group were roughly equal. So going to graphs, we use the clinical stage and best AJCC stage to determine the characteristics of the tumor. And generally, a higher number for both of these stages means a worse prognosis and more developed tumor. So the Gleason scores are assigned by the physician and it's directly transferable to the clinical grade. So we don't see many differences for the clinical grades, but on the AJCC stage, we see that there are more um, higher values associated, but none of it is significant. Moving forward, we go to the black strata and we do have a smaller sample size, which may um, impact our ability to detect differences. But we do see, once again, a significance in the family history with an almost 25% increase of those who do have a family history of prostate cancer in the pandemic group. Again, we don't see any significance in the treatments, which is good. And we, don't, we didn't include the white strata because it reflects that of the original population since over 90% of it was white. So moving to the comparisons on the decent scores based on race, we have the white race on the left side and the black on the right graph. And we see for the white patients that there were a little bit fewer cases um, of a Gleason score of one and the rest of the scores are roughly equal. But on the black side, we see that there is a considerable increase in the Gleason scores of five and a much bigger decrease in the Gleason scores of four. Moving on to the best AJCC stage, which measures the metastasis of the tumors. We see that for both races, there was a considerable increase in the later stages, which are three and four during the pandemic than those before. And during the pre-pandemic, we also see that there were larger amounts of stage one and two, which are less intense. So overall, we see for the pandemic group that they are more likely to have a family history of cancer, especially among black patients. And they were slightly more likely to reside in rural counties at diagnosis, but there was no difference in the age, race, or tobacco use. Also that there is no association between the um, the treatments received between the pre-pandemic and pandemic group. And also, but without significance, we see that there's a larger proportion of late stage tumors which were diagnosed during the pandemic. So as data becomes more available, we can examine the impact of socioeconomic status on those patients because maybe those with better statuses were able to get better treatments or faster treatments. We could also see that the effect the pandemic had on the time to treatment, so how long you wait for actually getting treated, and also the prognosis, which is basically the how well you handle the tumor. So overall, my learning experience involved coding with R, which was difficult at first, but my mentor helped me, reading research papers and fully di like digesting all the information, and also a project process of how you finding idea, like do research for it, get IRB grants in that situation. I would like to thank um, the CB site leaders, Dr. Galson, Dr. Sen, and Andrew, and also the Hillman Academy.
Okay, so you want to wear, or you don't want to wear the mic? Yeah, so just in general. Remember to hold the mic like here. Hello, everyone. My name is Lime Wu. I work in the WJ's lab. Our lab study is normal and abnormal hematopoiesis using mouse models and human samples. So I'm very glad to be here to introduce awesome students in the lab this summer. And the first one is Jason Chen. So Jason is from Cranberry Township, graduated from Seneca Valley High School, and will be attending John Hopkins University in the coming fall. With the goal, yeah, <laughs> with the goal of majoring in biology along the pre med road to achieve his ultimate goal of becoming a an anesthesiologist. Not only good at studying in his spare time, Jason likes to play piano and tennis. This is the second time that Jason attends the HCC Academy program with the goal of a to further develop his techn technical skills at the bench work. Obviously, he has reached his goal and very good. Congratulations. In the past seven weeks, Jason has done several challenging experiments, including plasmid amplification and the extraction as well as the vessel blood and the immunoprecipitation. Although most of the assays were very new to him at the beginning, he managed to perform all the experiment independently at the end. So I very admire his persistent, hardworking, and the passion to research. I'm also very glad to hear that he enjoyed the past seven weeks with us during his internship. So his topic today is thank you to interact in complex with the PMT5 and CTIP in response to DNA damage. Thank you for the introduction. Um, like Lime said, my name is Jason and I'm in the Do Lab, which focuses on blood related cancers. And my project specifically is about vanconinemia and one of the core proteins or one of the proteins associated with um, vanconinemia. And just as a bit of background, vanconinemia is a genetic disorder which affects blood marrow um, and it increases susceptibility to like cancers related with blood. And there's 22 genes associated with this disorder. However, there's a core pathway that I made a diagram for. As you can see, it starts out with about eight core proteins and it monoubiquinates into two more important proteins. And of one of them, my focus is on FANCD2, which um, I guess activates downstream DNA damage repair proteins. So the whole purpose of my experiment um, for the past six, seven weeks was to see if FANCD2, this important protein, the FA pathway, interacts with other proteins in response to DNA damage. So one of the proteins of interest was CTIP, which is part of the, another pathway known as MRN. And it recognizes DNA double strand breaks and is a major player in homologous recombination. Another protein that I was really interested in was PMT5, which is um, one of the many PMTs, which are protein arginine uh, methyltransferase, which regulate the methylation of P53. And, uh, I guess insufficient activation leads to like more damage. However, excessive, well, no, if, it, sorry, <laughs> I got that backwards. PMT5, if it's not sufficient enough, um, there's loss of genetic integrity. However, if it's too um, excessive, the cell will take more damage. And it's been proven before that the FA core complex protein, one of them, FANG fan A, if there's a deficiency in that, then PMT5 is downregulated, which is why I think that there is an interaction between PMT5 and FANCD2. 
So therefore, my hypothesis is that if we induce DNA damage, then NCD2 will activate into a core complex, um, protein complex with these two proteins of interest. So for my mythology, like I, like Lee May said earlier, I had many assays, but one of them that was super interesting was the um, immunoprecipitation assay, which I'm going to explain a bit about, where you go through the EFAL protein lysis. However, you isolate the um, protein of interest by binding it with an antibody and then using agro speeds to like separate. I found this to be super interesting. I never knew this was like a technique and it has many like useful applications. Downstream you can run Westerns, which is what I did. And this allows for the protein to be isolated and all other related proteins, like especially if it's like in a protein complex will all be dragged along with the protein that you're trying to antibody or that you incubate with an antibody rather. So as for my experimental design, um, I worked with the HEK293 T cell, which is a human embryonic kidney cell. And it's very useful for transfections, which is what I did. As you can see here, I transfected with two different plasmids. They're both overexpressions of fan CD2. However, the mutant version does not mono ubiquitinate, which means B2 is there. However, uh, there's no downstream. And after we get the transfection overexpression of the HEK293 T cell, we will then use a selection to make sure that there, um, only the transfected cells remain. And I was originally going to use G41A selection. However, since there's a time constraint, we decided to use um, pyromycin instead. And after that, we use Western bot to confirm overexpression. And then that's when we do immunoprecipitation. As you can see, that's a lot of work to do in just like six, seven weeks. So it was a really tight schedule. And I didn't get to do ultimately what I wanted to do, which is do immunoprecipitation with the transfected cells. However, I still performed it with like, the non-transfected cells just to see if there was any complex at all. So as you can see, this Western blot was run during, not during the complete stage of transfection, but like rather in between. So there's still some endogenous um, expression. It's not completely overexpression. So as you can see in the model, in comparison to the, oh, well, both transfected cell lines have a more I guess, increased expression in D2, which is what we're looking for. And this is, like I said, not even like during the full transfected stage, this is still like undergoing transfection. I just have to like run our Western and make sure that transfection was successful. And then after that, this is a sort of a messy Western blot, but it was a test run since I didn't have time to like do the fully transfected cells. And even though it's sort of messy, you can still see that on the right of both diagrams here, um, these are the amino precipitated with CTIP on the left and fancy D2 on the right. And as you can see, the PMT5 band showed up on both um, Westerns, which confirms that there is some interaction. However, I would have to rerun this, obviously, because it's very messy. And it's only like um, that I have so far for this amino precipitation. But it does confirm my theory that um, there is interaction, although it's not very strong uh, given this data. So then as a conclusion, we can say for sure that um, the transfected cells do overexpress. And one of the future directions is to run another Western on the fully transfected cells to confirm. Because I did a Western using D2, not flag HA, which still has, like I said, endogenous um, expression. So, and then we also can say that irradiation induced cell damage does form a protein complex. However, we want to rerun that We're using the fully transfected cells as well to confirm results. And as for myself, I feel like some future goals for myself is to like be more, I guess, meticulous in my lab work, make sure I'm doing everything correctly. Like if I go back here, I think the main cause of this Western being so messy is because I had an arrow loading buffer and the ratio wasn't right. So like all the proteins started like floating up and like rank along down the well instead of being one congregate um, band. And like many others, I have a lot of people to thank for this project. These past six weeks have been so much to me. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, Dr. Du, Lee May, and they've been along my side for like everything, just guiding me along. And also I'd like to thank Dr. Gallison and Andrew and um, Dr. Sen for running the program. It's been great so far. I would even like to give out a shout out for all the CD students. They were the ones that made this program so great. And Dr. Boone, Solomon, and Stephen for running the program, like doing all the background work. This would have never been possible without them. And of course, the um, uh, university and the many foundations that helped fund it. Thank you.
We are running slightly ahead. Slow it down just a little bit. There. I'm getting so fast at this. Uh, okay, so our next scholar is uh, Ethan and his introducer. Oh, while I'm thinking about it. Okay. Okay. Hello again. As we also have a uh, very furniture to have the second student is a in the lab for the past seven weeks. So is lives in Robinson Township with his parents and three siblings. He's good at a uh, playing piano and is learning the harp. He's recently graduated from a mentor high school and will be attending Haverford College in this coming fall. He will be managing in biology with the pre-med track as well hopefully to go medical school eventually. So he's joined to a human academy program because he wants to get insight into what a scientist is really like. He's eager to learn and cooperate he's, because he's always the first one to get into the lab every morning. Although this is the uh, first time attending HCC academy program, Ethan has mastered several techniques such as Cell culture, mass bone marrow cell isolation, cloning formula, unition IC, and the PCR and immunofluorescence staining. In addition, it's always allowed to collaboration and help others. It's the brightest our days with his lover and kindness. He hopes to continue this research during his time in college. We wish him all the best in the college. So let's his hear his presentation on the project, the deletion of the CTRP effects on damage repair and the hematopoietic stem cell function in mice. All right, thank you, Vinay. All right, so my name is Ethan and my project is on the deletion of CTRP's effects on DNA damage repair and hematopoietic stem cell function in mice. For some brief background, CTIP is a protein that is a partner of the MRE11, RAD50, NBS1, or MRN, DNA damage sensor protein complex. So as you can see on that picture on the right, the, whenever your DNA is damaged and both strands break, that's obviously a double strand break. And so whenever that happens, the MRN complex, which you can see in those three circles right there, the blue and green, that is involved in getting to the point of homologous recombination, which is really important for actually fixing the double strand breaks. But the exact role of CTIP, which is a partner of that complex, is kind of contentious and hotly debated in the scientific community right now. So we're not really exactly sure of the exact role of CTIP yet. So what we want to know is what happens to mice when you delete CTIP in their hematopoietic stem cells, which are the cells that are found in your bone marrow and eventually become all the types of blood cells that your body needs. So for our experimental design, we utilized two main models, being the wild type, which is the control, just generic mice, and the knockout model, which is basically trying to remove or disrupt the expression of the CTIP gene via exon 2. And because this is actually embryonically lethal, it's been found in previous experiments that if you remove the CTIP when the mice are still in the embryonic stage, they cannot survive. So we have to use an inducible model, meaning that we do this when the mouse is already mature and alive. So we use tamoxifen injections and we inject the tamoxifen to then remove the gene from the mice while they're already mature. And we do that through a knockout of CTIP code because I believe they are mice. So there are like three main methods in terms of assays that I use. The first being immunofluorescent staining for non-adherent cells, which I spent a lot of my time doing um, 
it mainly relies on cytospinning these non-adherent cells from being suspension cells onto a cover slip and then counting them and everything. And then you have to go with the process of staining and treating them to eventually get to the point of being able to do foci imaging, which is essentially in this specific immunofluorescence, we use the foci to kind of see where the DNA damage is happening, where the DNA damage repair process has been triggered on the cells. And you can kind of see through these tiny, really clear focused dots, which I'll show you the results of that later. And then also the colony forming unit or CFU, which is a very long process, very rigorous. And it starts all the way with bone flushing. So you have to get these cells from the bones and then isolate them and then do media culturing and incubation. And then after seven days, you can look at the specific colonies, which are just groups of cells for their progenitor activities and get some insight into the lineages that they're actually becoming. And then also we use PCR, just polymerase chain reaction, and we use gel electrophoresis imaging for that. So going right into the PCR data, so these are my results from my gel electrophoresis. And what we actually wanted to like know from these were whether the mouse models uh, have the deletable CTIP gene, because if they have the CTIP COCO or the CVER, that means that we are able to use tamoxifen to delete those genes. And so as you can see right there, as you can see right there, um, those three have the CTIP COCO, which means that they are deletable. And then the wild type is also there and then different places so you can kind of see which are which. And then on the right, the CRE-ER. Again, you can see that these three are all the CRE-ER and then this is the negative control, which is again in a completely different place. So theoretically, after you inject the tamoxifen, the bands um, of the CRE-ER and the ctip COCO should be gone because that's kind of how you know that the tamoxifen injection was successful. Um, but I just want to mention that the assays were only possible on the wild type models for my experiment because we were unable to get the knockout model cells and I'll elaborate why in a second. So the tamoxifen injections take five days of actual injections and then seven days of waiting for the results and kind of analyzing what happened to the mice. And we actually have found that the knockout mice have been unable to survive. As you can see on the bottom, those graphs are kind of graphing the counts of different kinds of blood cells through the seven days after the tamoxifen injections. And especially you can really see with the white blood cells on the left, you can really see that the white blood cell count dropped drastically. So that really tells us that when the CTIP is gone in these mice, they really can't function properly. And that kind of signifies that CTIP is really important for them to be able to go about their normal body processes. And the death is likely not solely from the tamoxifen. We don't think that's because of the dosage solely or anything like that. It's likely a gene deletion problem meaning that the CTIP is very important for the hematopoietic systems processes. So these are my foci results. Like I said, we were only able to do the foci on the wild type full bone marrow cells, but we did get some preliminary foci stainings. And when I was talking about like the kind of clear dots, like that's an example of like the foci that you can actually see. They're very kind of clear and concise um, areas of very um, bright color. And so we get the gamma H2X, which is green, the CTIP, which is red, and the DAPI, which is blue. And we merge them into one picture to kind of be able to see any areas of overlap and where in the actual cell, the DNA in the nucleus, the DNA damage is happening. Because this actual um, circle right there that the DAPI shows is just the nucleus. So um, we're kind of just focusing on the DNA damage repair in the nucleus. And then for the CFU, this is the results that I'm probably the most proud of because it was really hard to do. Um, on the left, that's like a picture of the entire well of all the colonies that I got. Um, as you can see, there was quite a few and I think it worked pretty well. And it was, like I said, a very long process. And then on the right, you can see some of the lineages that I had. The most common ones that I had were BFUE, CFUG, CFUGEMM, CFUGM. And I also had CFUM, which isn't shown here. So obviously, even though this is just control, it's not gonna tell us anything like groundbreaking or new, but we could use this to compare to the knockout mice that we get later. And it's just um, very cool to kind of see the specific colonies. And in terms of future directions, there's definitely like a lot of things that we could do with kind of the information that we got from this. So we're currently working on the optimization of the tamoxifen injection to establish a partial CTIP deletion in the mice's hematopoietic system. Um, like I said, the quick, death, the quick death of the mice is consistent with the embryonic lethality, which really does suggest that CTIP does play a really crucial role in the um, hematopoietic system. And we really just want to kind of further our knowledge into actually why that is. So definitely kind of trying to establish a partial deletion might let us have the, some form of knockout without actually killing them all the way. And then we also were able to get knock-in mice. And in these, CTIP seems a lot more dispensable than in the knockout mice. 
Um, and basically a knock-in model is kind of similar to a knockout model, but instead of knocking out the entire gene, you'd knock in a mutant gene to kind of change the expression. And basically CTIP protein itself is likely really essential for the blood system in some capacity. And that's definitely one of the big takeaways of this entire experience for me. Right. And then for my acknowledgements, I'd just like to really thank Dr. Wei Du and the lab for all the hospitality and kindness. My lab mentors, Li Mei Wu and Neha Tali, for helping me so much with techniques and learning and just being so nice, as well as our lab technician, Jesse Gao, for helping me with the technical problems and things like that. And also Jason Chen, who is in my lab, for helping me out and making it a fun experience. And then for the CB site, Dr. Deb Galson, Dr. Matthew Chasen, and Andrew, thank you so much. I know, I know it was really hard for you guys to organize everything. And then from the, cans, uh, the, from the Hillman overall, David Boone, Solomon Lipschitz, and Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones. <laughs> Let's go for a few minutes. Um, I guess I just want to say I had a lot of fun. Uh, had a lot of fun working with your students. Uh, Andrew and I and Malabika ran our lab meetings every week. Um, and your students were engaged and participating and, and it was really good to see. And I can see from how things were at the beginning when you had to talk about your projects and how they are now, you've all grown a lot. Um, so that's good to see. Um, and let me work on getting this off. Okay, so uh, we're up, ready for Nancy and her introducer. You guys can take it a little bit slow. We're still running a little ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Yvonne Chow. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Chen, um, who is a rising senior at Seneca Valley High School. Um, she'll be the first in her family to attend college and I hope I've convinced her to apply to my alma mater, but um, Brown. <laughs> um, this is my first time serving as a mentor, so I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I've been um, very impressed with what Nancy has accomplished this summer. She very quickly became an integral member of our lab um, from pre presenting at journal clubs to um, helping to develop a new assay for the lab, which she will tell you a little bit about today. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing about her enthusiasm for science and about her very many um, career ambitions, which are varied, um, which range from bioengineering to neurosurgery. Um, but whatever she decides to do, I know she will succeed. So um, here we go. Hi, so my name is Nancy, and my project this summer was on the evaluation of how Snorty 67 promotes metastases. So uh, some background. Uh, so in my lab, we work with uh, snow RNA, which is a non-coding RNA that is just regulated in cancer, but is unknown how it regulates cancer growth. And studies have shown that Snow RNA is a possible prognostic marker for many cancers. There are about 200 identified uh, snow RNAs, but the one we are working with is Snorty 67. So a previous study generated an animal model of metastases by lymph node using 41 breast cancer cells. It was found that Snorty 67 is overexpressed in lymph node metastases and the knockout, which doesn't have the Snorty 67, uh, leads to decreased proliferation and decreased lymph node tumor growth and distant metastases. So our primary objective was to determine how Snorty 67 permit, uh, regulates metastases. And our hypothesis was that uh, Snorty 67 is essential for metastases from lymph node, but not from ma the mammary fat pad, which is like the breast of the mice. Uh, methylation of Snorty 67 target RNA U6 is critical for metastases. So we first injected uh, cancer cells into the mammary fat pad and measured metastases to the lymph nodes and the lung. Then we harvested the lymph nodes and then we used qPCR to quantify the cancer cells. 
We also harvested the lung and we quantified the cancer cells using qPCR and amine histochemistry. So QP qPCR is quantitative real-time PCR. And when we harvested the lung, we isolated the RNA and then we used qPCR to quantify the cancer cells using a reporter gene. Using immune histochemistry, uh, we took sections of a lung and stained them with uh, H&E stain. We took pictures under a microscope and quantified the tumor areas of each section using ImageJ. So these are examples of the uh, slides we got. Um, so you can see here, this uh, is like a tumor area. So we would quantify this and here as well. This here would be like normal cell growth. All right, so this is a graph of the IH, uh, has the chemistry and qPCR. Uh, so as you can see, I, IHC and qPCR are relatively similar except for like two. And so we came to the conclusion that storm 67 is necessary for metastases to the lymph node, but not to the lung when injected to the memory fat pad. So the first two graphs are uh, lung metastases. So um, the first one is using immunohistochemistry, which we can see there is uh, a statistically significant decrease in both knockout AC4 and AC5 right here and right here. But in the qPCR, uh, it shows that there is only one statistically significant knockout. But this makes sense because we have we took five slices of the lung from the left from the left lung, and we used the whole right lung for qPCR. And qPCR is also far more sensitive than immunohistochemistry. And then on the picture to the far right, we see a lymph node metastases. And both, we can see that both uh, knockouts are statistically significant, meaning that we can conc conclude that uh, SNORD67 is necessary for metastases to the lymph node. Uh, a question we are trying to answer is if SNORD67 methylated U6 methylation is important for metastases. Uh, so U6 is a known as a small nuclear RNA target of SNORD67. So to answer this question, we generated various cell lines, the wild type 41, SNORD67 SNORD knockouts, AC4 and AC5, which are single celled clones. And uh, we created knockouts with rescued swarm E67 overexpression, which are known as OE, and knockouts with rescued mutant swarm E67 overexpression, MOE. So the difference between OE and MOE uh, is by one base pair, which prevents site-specific methylation. So on the picture um, uh, to the far right, far left, far left, um, you can see that there is a binding site right here, um, and SNORD67 binds to the target RNA, which leads to methylation. So we use RTLP experiments, which is known as a reverse transcription at low DNTP levels, followed by PCR, to check various like methylation statuses of these very cell lines. So whenever there is methylation, and that's when uh, the SNORD67 binds to the target U6, the reverse transcription is hindered with low levels of DNTP, uh, which in turn reduces the PCR amplification. So if we look at the picture to the left, um, so up here, that's which says with methylation, we can see the uh, reverse transcription products are not as efficient as without methylation. And so whenever we put this through uh, PCR and then through gel, uh, with methylation, that shows less intensity than without methylation. So we expect the knockout, which doesn't have the SNORD67, to show greater intensity at lower DNTP levels compared to wild type because the knockout doesn't have the SNORD67, which can't bind to the uh, U6 RNA. Okay, so these are some gel images we took. Um, and then we quantified these images using ImageJ. And on the picture to the left, you can see uh, 41 is lower in intensity compared to AC4. And that makes sense because 41 is a wild type and it has the SORTY67 gene, which can bind to the U6 RNA and methylate. But AC4, it doesn't have the gene, so uh, it can't methylate, meaning there are more reverse trans transcription products. And when amplified, 
it shows at greater intensity. And AC4OE here, um, so we rescued the SNORT67, meaning it has the gene, it has the RNA now, which can bind to the U6 RNA. And so it, it makes sense that it is similar to the 4T1. The AC4MOE, um, it has a rescued 67 as well, but we, it has a mutant, so it can't bind to U6 RNA. And it makes sense that it is similar to AC4 because uh, there is no methylation. So using these results, we can conclude that methylation of small nuclear RNA U6 at base pair 60 by SNORT67 could possibly be crucial for metastases. So in the future, we hope to use these cell lines to test as methylation is necessary for the cancer phenotype of SNORT67 rocket. All right, I would like to thank Dr. Chow uh, for mentoring me and looking over my project, uh, Hydro and Shiba for directly helping me and answering all my questions, Dr. Gowson, Dr. Sen, and Andrew for hosting the CB site and making all this possible, and the rest of Hellman Academy for this amazing experience. Hmm. Like now we're 15 minutes ahead. Um, okay, uh, Mohammed is next. Um, I think I'm gonna like wait five minutes before we start. Um, if anybody wants to share something. <laughs> Because uh, we, our last speaker is actually going to be zooming in, so if we get too far ahead, we'll have to sit here for a long time and wait for him. Um, unless he can go early, but uh, sure. They will go to bone, but they will die before they go to bone unless you resect the primary tumor. And then you can, like you guys do with some of the osteosarcoma models. Get this talk up while you guys, anybody else want to chat? Um, Well, I specialize in bone. So I work, my lab works primarily on multiple myeloma, which is a cancer, a blood cancer that is in the bone. But I also collaborate with a number of labs that do breast cancer metastasis to bone, um, which is why I happen to know about the 4T1 model. Um, I also work in a non-cancer area, which is Paget's disease of bone, which is the second most common metabolic bone disease after osteoporosis. Uh, it's the only bone disease where a man's hat size will get larger because you actually get aberrant bone growth. And so you not only get bad bone, you get larger bones. And so you get misshapen bones, but your skull can get add space. So it will actually increase your hat size. It's one of the early diagnostic methods for that. Um, and, and actually, since we have a couple minutes to spare, there are a lot of similarities between Paget's disease of bone and multiple myeloma bone disease in that, and, and other cancers that go to bone and that cancers are generally creating an inflammatory environment in the bone and they are altering the bone microenvironmental cells to misbehave. So many cancers, multiple myeloma breast cancer will make the osteoclasts, which are the cells that eat up your bone, uh, more active, and they will make the cells that build your bone, the osteoblasts with a B, um, stop dividing or stop differentiating rather, and become very inflammatory and cancer supportive. Um, and so it's called the vicious cycle. You may have heard about that particularly in the breast cancer. We have it in multiple myeloma as well. So a lot of what we do is to try to figure out how to interrupt those signals. 
And, and some of the signaling we found in Paget disease of bone turned out to be also at play in ophthalmyeloma bone disease. Yes. Okay, so while Mohammed and his introducer are working their way up, does anyone else have anything they want to ask about? No. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yelena Kim, and um, I'm a research scientist from Professor Haita Guo Laboratory. Uh, our main topic of research is the uh, carcinogenic effect of uh, uh, human hepatitis B virus infection. So my personal area is epigenetics of uh, hepatitis B virus, HBV, and um, uh, I'm flattered to be a part of this uh, uh, Human Cancer Center Summer Academy uh, program, and I'm happy uh, to present here in this uh, new building uh, our summer student, uh, Mohamed Al Nagar. Um, so, beyond the program, he's a, a student of Pittsburgh Science and Technology Academy. Uh, I can uh, characterize Mohamed as a smart, uh, reliable, and a very punctual person. Uh, he's a bright, proactive, and a diligent student. And at the same time, he possesses um, independent thinking. <laughs> um, been uh, lots of fun and pleasure to work with him. Uh, he successfully reached all the goals and objectives of the assigned projects, uh, which he's going to present. And uh, I wish uh, Mr. Al Nagash uh, best of luck in his future endeavors. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Muhammad Ali Al Nagash, and uh, as my mentor uh, introduced, my ooh, my project is on M6 methylene adenosine RNA post transcriptional modification in the hepatitis B viral infection. And I'm a student of the Hillman Center Academy, and I'm part of uh, Ms. Dr. Uh, Gould's lab. And my mentor was Ian McKim. So you probably heard of it before because it's you know it's not nothing new. But what is HPV? The HPV or the hepatitis B virus is a large scale infection as more than 300 million people live with chronic hepatitis B and it roughly kills about a million people every year. In many cases, the, the virus itself can be asymptomatic, but some symptoms include dark, dark urine, pain in the abdomen and fatigue and nausea. But in a lot of uh, cases, especially in the youth, there are no symptoms, which makes it very scary. The virus itself is transmitted uh, horizontally and vertically horizontally through sexual contact and other uh, cr uh, cross contaminations such as blood transfusions, needles, and also vertical transmission as it can be hereditary. So just a, like a very brief structure of the, uh, the actual virus. The virus itself is made up of uh, lipids and large, medium, and small surface proteins, as you can see right here. The, these core proteins form an icosahedral capsid around the genome, and the genome is a 3.2 kilobase genome that encodes uh, four overlapping open-ended uh, reading frames and four mRNA transcripts. So what am I testing? Uh, the HPV infection can progress into liver, fibro liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. So we were observing the M6A RNA profile in these HPV-infected cells. So our objective really was to model HPV infection in primary human hepatocytes by M6A RNA post-transcriptional modification profiling in HPV-infected cells. But why do we choose M6A? Well, as you might have recalled from Daniel or Kate's presentation, M6A or N6 methyladenosine is one of the most prevalent modifications of mRNA, which affects stability and transcription of the methylated RNA. Here on the right, you can see a picture of the methylation and demethylation cycle, which is um, with uh, these writer proteins that methylate the RNA and these eraser proteins that demethylate the RNA. The RNA methylation plays an important role in cellular functions, such as metabolism, embryonic development, and stem cell renewal. 
with HPV infection, the RNA can be altered or reduced the mRNA stability or inhibit translation. So here's just very brief uh, image of my experimental workflow. So you obviously start with the cells, the live cells that we uh, got from uh, our humans that are, you know, from the lab, not from the lab, you know, from, but yeah, we infected these uh, primary human hepatocytes or these liver cells with wild type uh, uh, HPV. And then we purified the RNA of the HPV and then we fragmented it into optimal size for us to work with. Then we immunoprecipitated these, uh, um, at these RNAs with with anti M6 with anti RNA anti M6A antibodies, and then we sent it to RT qPCR, and then it was eventually sequenced through M6C, M6A seq and high seq 2000. I came to this pro I came into this program at the start of the second uh, replication of this experiment, and I have not gotten to the M6A uh, sequencing yet because it's very timely, and I'm only here a month and a half, so. It will be done soon. So for the actual fragmentation, this is just a, a, a graph showing that uh, the fragments was cut because on the ladder, it started off very large and then we fragmented it to more optimal size. As you can see on the ladder, it was much shorter. And this, the reason why we did it, just so it's more fragmented, uh, just to, so it's more optimal and size suitable for the next generation sequencing. Then through immunoprecipitation, the cells were immunoprecipitated with the anti M6A antibodies. And this is just a, 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 a table showing after the first replication, the uh, M6A sequencing, and then just a number of files read in the FASTQ file. And as you can see, in both the input, in both the infected and uninfected, you can see a, a decrease in the uh, sequence length, in the number of reads. And it's pretty uh, uniform. They were both around 30 million, but it just shows that the immunoprecipitation was successful. And for our quality control for uh, the second replication, uh, we, we chose the June B, which is a transcription factor. And the RTQPCR was used to confirm the, the M6A pull down. And the reason why we chose uh, June B is because, again, it was, a, it was a good quality control and the results were uh, very promising. And this was all done through the uh, pull down RNA and it was assessed with the Quanti IT Robert Green RNA assay. And uh, as you can see, there was a, the relative expression of June B in the uninfected, was uh, very high and also in the infected. So we see that the results were a success. This is a, a table showing based off the first replication of the, uh, the result, uh, related M6A sequence hits. And these include uh, MALAT1, which is a gene, which is a gene that uh, uh, involves uh, gene regulation. Uh, Calireticulin, which is a gene that binds to CA2 and is also a binding protein. Then there's also a, a polypop protein B, which is just another gene for gene replication and uh, complement component one, which is the blood formation gene and collagen alpha free, which is just a structural protein. And again, these are all the genes that were infected with HPV and it just had a higher uh, assortion of uh, M6A in post-transcriptional modification expression. So the conclusion that, uh, that this shows is that these hits could possibly serve as potential prognostic markers for HPV and may play a significant role in a HV associated pathogenesis. Further biological and technical replicates of this experiment are ongoing to confirm this. And the epto-transcriptomic epto analysis of HBC, HPV in a host cells will shed a new light on virus host interaction and the development of chronic HPV infection hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, for my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank David Boone and Stephen Jones because I was having a lot of technical difficulties and they made sure I was good. Uh, I also like to thank uh, De uh, Dr. Deborah Galson and uh, Malvi Kassan and Andrew for making the program enjoyable too. We got a lot of good laughs. And from my lab, I like to thank uh, Dr. Guo, and I also like to thank my mentor a lot. Uh, uh, Mrs. Kim helped me a lot through this program, and I, I came into this knowing nothing about HPV, and I'd say I'm pretty educated now. Uh, I also like to thank uh, Marwa and uh, Changdar for really taking me under their wing because a lot of the work I did in this lab had nothing to do with the experiment, but that's exactly what I wanted coming in. I just wanted to get more hands-on experience in the lab, and that's exactly what I got, so I can't complain. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Hu Shang and uh, Dr. Ning for also making it more enjoyable. As you can see at the bottom right, they treated me to some authentic Chinese, and it was an experience, but I liked it. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mrs. Andrea for uh, providing me with resources that are gonna help me a lot in the future. Thank you.
Okay, let's see how we're going to do it. Oh man, we're a good 15 minutes ahead. Um, somebody like to do a song and dance? <laughs> Not me. There is lots of time for questions because we are running 15 minutes ahead. So if we can slow it down just a little bit and let ourselves catch up with the schedule. That would be good. So if you've got a question, put it out there. Dr. Yelson? Yes. Yes? Uh, I don't mind going early if you uh, want to oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's we. You probably will have to go early, but we'll. Okay. See. There may that's be fine. other people who are trying to time their getting on their Zoom to see somebody. Oh, else. okay, okay, I see. But thank you for that. No we, problem. We'll probably end up a little early, so stay on board here. I was just going to give the mic. To Got you. it. So with HPV, it's a very large scale infection. There's around 300 million cases. So any information that could, that could potentially help us to find a cure would be very beneficial. The hits that we found after the first and hopefully that are confirmed in the second uh, replication after sequencing could be used as potential prognostic markers in uh, uh, diagnosing HPV and other uh, things like that. And also with the GMB uh, gene, there's just a lot of different things that HPV affects. And hopefully with these reads that we can like create potential drugs to help uh, progress us in the right direction. Thank you for your question. So immunoprecipitation is a step that, uh, that we did in my experiment, which involves us pulling down the RNA through, uh, yeah, immunoprecipitation is the name. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, uh, you talking about the, this experience. Well, I went into the experience just to see this, uh, this field of, you know, being a, a PhD doc, like research doc scientist was for me. And I, I plan on pursuing a medical career. And to be honest, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. But uh, I, I very much uh, enjoy the experience. I, I've definitely got a head start on the rest of my peers. And I know I'm, even if I do become a med student, I'm going to have to do research work in the lab. So I'm very happy that I got just a hands-on experience. And I'm 100% satisfied with my experience and everything that I took from it. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that as you move along your career, finding out what you don't want to do is as important as finding out what you do want to do. My, my son, I had a, set him up before we had a program like this to just spend a couple of weeks in some colleagues' labs. And when I asked him at the end what he thought, he said, well, you know, the only one I really liked was the zebrafish lab. And I said, well, why was that? Because I could see them. So I, I, I couldn't, I didn't really relate to the things, you know, a lot of invisible liquid in tubes. I couldn't deal with it. Well, he's a cinematographer now. <laughs> so that seeing was really important. Um, okay, well, that was really nice. Um, let me get the next one lined up here. Uh, down. Oh. Oops. Where's the sensor?
Right, Anthony, you are up with your introducer. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, our fellow Hellman Academy students, lab PIs, lab mentors, and a family. So welcome. So things were running a little early, so Debbie, so I had a few, uh, I think I'll catch a few extra minutes on this. So my name is Jan Yu. So I'm a professor in the Department of Pathology. My lab has hosted many academy students. And today I wanna to take it, the reason I usually just let uh, the lab mentor introduce the students, but I really wanna do this today for several reasons. First of all, as you all know that how hard it has been to try to set this program up and for during the pandemic. So I really have a big shout for Dr. Gaussen and the, the overall the academy program directors and the staff and your team and your wonderful and thank you very much for this. Secondly, I want to do this. Is I wanted to thank the lab mentors, Dr. Brian Libowitz who is the lab mentor for Anthony this year, and he mentored many students in past however many years. And he helped with academy programs, recruitment, teaching, a lot of things. And I wanted to thank you, lab mentors. You are wonderful. You do much more than what I do. Thank you. I do this because I'm also a mother of academy student this year. My daughter's a hand in the hand. He, he's, she's in a different program and her presentation, but no planning. It's exactly the same time as Anthony's. She's presenting in the uh, Herberman conference room. Um, Okay, so the lastly, of course, I wanted to introduce Anthony, right? So I thank everyone. And it's always wonderful to have students in the lab. They bring um, fresh air, I would say, to the lab and sort of re-educate us how we all got started when we started our career. So Anthony is a rising senior at, uh, where are you? I have to figure out your school and Upper St. Clair High School. And I think uh, by interacting with him, so we learn a few things about him. He's a very curious person. He asks a lot of questions and he writes well. And I think he plays piano as well as football, right? So, he does quite a few things outside of science, but he's really interested in science. And he wants to be a surgeon. And he admires Albert Einstein. Those are a few things I've learned. So they are interesting. So my lab study intestinal cancer and uh, injury. And you will hear his talk or the project at the end is a little bit from everybody different from most people, as you've heard a lot that cancer patients are treated with a chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, and a toxicity or a complication to the gastrointestinal system is a major limiting factor in most of those patients. So his project is trying to understand how this occurs and is there are specific ways we can actually protect one's intestine from chemotherapy, radiation, and how to make stem cells live long and happy. With that said, Anthony, I'm gonna let you take the podium. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, uh, my summer project is uh, targeting Puma to enhance intestinal regeneration. So chemotherapy and radiation are the most common forms of cancer treatment. And 
they uh, both damage DNA and they are designed to target rapidly dividing tumor cells. Now, the small intestine is the most rapidly proliferating tissue in the adult mammal. This makes it extremely sensitive to cancer treatment and it's a limiting factor for most cancer patients. So the small intestine is made up of two structures, um, crypts and villi. Now the villi are long finger-like structures that branch off into the small intestine and uh, their job is for nutrients absorption and they proliferate very often and they replace every three to five days. The other uh, structure is the crypts. Now the crypts are what house the stem cells and other terminally differentiated cells like the pan of cells, and they reside at the bottom of the crypts. And this function, and this whole tissue is uh, very important to be intact because it keeps the barrier between the outside in. Small intestine, believe it or not, is actually outside of your body. And this barrier functions as a barrier from the inside, uh, from the outside in. So radiation-induced intestinal injury. So when, you know, Cancer patients, they have chemotherapy, they have radiation for their cancer care. They experience DNA damage from the ionizing radiation of the chemotherapy. And when that happens, it sets off these signal pathways and it starts at ATM and then to check two, and then it goes to a P53, which is a tumor suppressant gene. And that could either go two ways. That could go to P21, which is responsible for cell cycle arrest and repair, or PUMA, which is uh, responsible for cell apoptosis. Uh, so uh, in most cancers, in fact, two thirds of cancers, this pathway is uh, mutated, meaning it's unavailable, it's not working properly. Uh, so uh, my mentor and my PI have uh, come up with a small molecule PUM inhibitor, which I don't think, oh, there's the picture, which is this right here, the small molecule. And basically how this works is PUMA, the protein uh, found inside you, uh, when expressed, it binds to these family of proteins called BCL2, and it's the whole family. And uh, this family has pro-apoptotic uh, uh, proteins, and they also have anti-apoptotic proteins. So when Puma binds to the anti-apoptotic proteins, the pro-apoptotic proteins are freed up to formulate cell apoptosis. Uh, when it binds to the pro-apoptotic proteins, well, well, what we do is we come made the PUMA inhibitor, which will bind to PUMA, which will stop it from binding to the pro-apoptotic proteins, keeping the balance between this family. So this is what we'll do, and this is what will stop the initial cell death that you get as response to radiation or DNA damage. Okay, and there's the PUMA, and there's the PUMA inhibitor. Okay, so the experiment. So we set up two groups of mice and they were radiated with 9.1 grave radiation. And one group was given three doses of the PUM inhibitor, uh, two hours before radiation injury, uh, 24 hours after, and then 48 hours. Uh, the other group uh, was uh, a vehicle control group given PBS. And we looked at the tissue at 12 days. So the first thing we did to see the tissue was we performed H&E staining. And we did this because we wanted to see the structures in, of the tissue. And the first thing we did was we counted the number of crypts because the number of crypts directly correlates to the health of the tissue. Once again, the crypts are where the stem cells and other terminally differentiated cell types reside. And we found that on average, the Puma I group, the group treated with the Puma inhibitor, had more crypts and they had on 30% more. So in the graph, it shows at time zero or zero radiation. That's the kind of normal level of crypts, the normal tissue unirradiated mice, that's how they look. And, and in vehicle, in the control group, they had about 30% less than Puma. Okay, so the next thing we did was another H&E stain. And what we did this time was we stained again to see the tissue, but this time we measured the villi. Now, the villi also directly correlate to the crypts. Uh, the villi and the length of the villi and the, the overall health uh, directly correlates to them because they're like a conveyor belt. Uh, the stem cells sit in the crypts and they divide, 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 divide. And new cells that they make are pushed up into the villi and they make these structures. And uh, once again, they're for nutrient absorption and they're very important because they're constantly under chemical and mechanical stress because of the things we eat. So we don't want short and stubby villi. Uh, so what we found was shown in the picture, these two pictures, one is the vehicle, the other one is the Puma I group. And you could see how one, they're taken at the same magnification. One is longer than the other. 
And the Puma I group was actually longer than the other. And here's a graph that shows that zero days, that's what normal villi length looks like. And at 12 days irradiation, uh, you have Puma I longer than uh, vehicle control. So the next technique we used was immunofluorescence staining. And we stained for phosphohistone 3 or pH 3. And what we wanted to see was we wanted to see the rate of proliferation that was going on in this tissue. We wanted to get an idea of, well, how often was this tissue proliferating? Uh, because it is important to proliferate to maintain that gut barrier between the outside uh, in. So what we found in these two pictures, the cells, the green dots illuminated in green are the positive cells for pH 3. So the positive cells that are going through mitosis. And we found that vehicle has less of this happening than Puma. And the graph shows this as you have at zero days, you have this background level of proliferation that goes on, this constant, you know, uh, proliferation to maintain this structure. But when the injury occurs, both these groups jump up. You have a vehicle in the vehicle control group, you have more proliferation happening to replace the damage. And then in Puma, you have this drastic increase. And that is, and that is good. We want to see that because we want to see proliferation in this issue. Okay, so the next thing we did was immunofluorescence standing for gamma H2X, which is a protein associated with DNA damage. So this is the breakage of the uh, double, double strand uh, DNA. So what we found here was, remember, these two groups experienced initial radiation. They experienced the initial DNA damage, and we wanted to see what group was clearing it better, what group was getting rid of it more efficiently. And what we found was in the vehicle group, we had you know, this kind of DNA damage that lingered. And then in the Puma group, they cleared it much more efficiently. And here's the graph that supports this too. All right, so the last immunofluorescent thing we did, the last kind of test to see what, how this tissue looks. And we did immunofluorescent staining for MMP7, which is a protein associated with PANA cells. And like I said at the beginning, uh, the PANA cells are super important. They make up the stem cell crypt compartment at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the crypts. And they are extremely important in the organization of the matters because they secrete a lot of things to help uh, the stem cells thrive and divide. So in these two photos, you could see uh, vehicle and Puma I, you have vehicle, the illuminated cells in uh, orange or red, uh, those are the pan of cells. And they're kind of chaotically uh, dispersed all throughout the crypts. There's kind of no uh, rhyme or reason in which they're placed in. But in Puma I, you can see the fact that there's a clear order. They're clearly set in an order at the bottom of the crypts. And this was really important to see. And this is a very good photo. Um, up here on, is the mouse going? All right. So up here, over here, this photo, this photo is illuminating the, in, in, uh, in red, you have the pan of cells, and then in green, you actually have the stem cells. So you can see the clear organization that they need to be in to, to be functional. And Puma I directly shows that. Here you have the graph. The graph, we did, we got this graph by saying the position zero would be this. Oh, oh sorry. Getting far ahead of myself here, sorry. Uh, so this is position zero. Uh, and we counted the uh, cells up to the one side and up to the other side. And that's how we came up with these positions. So in Puma, you had most of their pan of cells in position zero out of four. Um, in uh, vehicle, you had 50% of them in zero out of four and 50% of them in five and up. So they were very disorganized. So the conclusion, so the takeaway from this and what, what, I, what I learned and what what the big takeaway is, is the fact that, you know, since the Puma inhibitor, it blocked the initial stem cell death. The initial stem cell apoptosis is response to uh, radiation-induced injury. But what we got was we got a whole lot more cells to start the regeneration process with than normal. And my mentor used this analogy, and I think it makes sense for me, and it makes sense as soon as I heard this, is it's the difference between building two houses. One, you start building a house with 20 workers, and then the other, you start building a house with two and what house would get finished faster. And it's the one with 20 workers. So in this case, what tissue looked better? It was, well, the tissue that looked, that had a lot more stem cells to start the regeneration process with. Um, so this not only meant the Puma group was proliferating more, clearing their DNA damage more efficiently, and had overall better organization to the terminally differentiated cells. But uh, this also was reflected uh, in the survival curve of the animal. Uh, uh, out of 12 of the vehicle uh, animals, uh, two survived, and out of uh, 12 of the Puma I animals, 
uh, seven survive. So, so future directions where this is going, I sadly don't have enough time to be with you guys. I love this experience, but in the future, uh, my mentor and PI would like to look at uh, future like stem cell, uh, the assess the amount of stem cells and the numbers, the exact numbers that you were left with after Puma I. And they'd also like to measure the barrier and functions. Uh, and this would also like to be seen in clinical trials because this drug not only has the chance to improve cancer patients and their quality of life, but really improve their care. So um, I acknowledge this. I'd like to thank everyone so much, first of all, listening to me. Uh, second of all, I'd like to thank uh, my PI, Dr. Yu and Brian for putting up with my a million questions. He's up there. <laughs> and uh, my mom and dad, there they are. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galson, too. I appreciate it. And any questions? So the, the length of the villi is, is good. You want long villi because that's how the nutrients get absorbed. And what, what, what the graph, what I showed in the graph was the fact that what normal villi look like and where after given Puma eye after injury where they were not quite there yet, but they were subpar. And that's, and then the, the point, the, the important thing of that is they were better than un untreated Puma eye or vehicle. This was done with radiation. Yeah, so uh, my mentor up there, Brian, they actually did this uh, Puma knockout mice, right? I ran a TCAN, which it was highly protected to. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is April Sagan. I am a postdoc in Hattusha Alvin-Biagli's lab, where I develop computational methodologies to model gene regulatory networks, um, specifically with single cell and multiomics data. Um, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Hilary Boizo, who I've had the pleasure to work with this summer in our lab. She graduated with honors from the Pittsburgh Science and Technology Academy this past spring. Uh, previously, she has worked with Anna Lakshin's lab studying the role of Adam TS13 in ovarian cancer. And this fall, she'll be attending Case Western, uh, where she's been studied to become a nurse practitioner, something I have no doubt she's gonna succeed in. Uh, this summer, Hillary's project involved a lot of computational techniques for working with biological data. And I'm incredibly impressed by how much she was able to learn and accomplish in such a short period of time. Um, so without further ado, All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Hilary Boyza Magnu, and I spent this summer working in Dr. Osman Bayalru's lab on working on a computational framework known as Spartan to analyze gene regulation using surface proteins and transcriptional regulation in breast cancer. So, to start it off, I'm going to talk a little bit about the programming computer side of my project, which is single cell sequencing. Now, single cell, single cell sequencing uh, can measure genome, uh, transcriptomes, and other multiomics of single cells. Computational prediction of gene regulation based on single cell genomics is becoming more of a new and um, active field of study. Um, examples of single cell sequencing are um, SiteSeq, uh, which measures the amount of proteins um, in a single cell using the droplet method. So as you can see on the image um, to my left, your right, it shows the lab side of what a uh, cytic is. Um, and so as you can see, there's been a uh, antibody attaching to the genetic material so that when it is transcribed, it will show where um, that uh, barcode came from, so to say. And then a uh, single cell RNA sequencing measures um, what gene is being transcribed in cells. And so as opposed to bulk cell analysis, 
a single cell sequencing will tell us about a cell specific type of gene. And now onto the biology side part of my uh, background, uh, transcription factors. Now, if you may or may not remember, transcription factors are proteins that control the rate of transcription of genetic material from DNA through messenger RNA. Um, and what it will do, it will bind to a specific uh, sequencing, as you can see where it says um, binding site. And from that, it will bind to the DNA sequence and then uh, create protein, or will regulate genes, which will then create proteins. Now, there are three ways that they normally act. They can either be activators, enhancers, or suppressors. So they will either um, activate uh, certain genes, uh, enhance, so increase the amount of production, or suppress, which means it will hinder and stop basically the production of these genes. Now, they are quite, um, they're difficult to measure the effectiveness of transcription factor. And one way to do so is through uh, having target genes. So as you can see in my little model, we have transcription factors with their known target genes. Um, and so if there is an increase or change to the gene regulation, for example, if gene one is down, gene two is upregulated, and gene three is upregulated, then we can infer that uh, transcription factor two or TF2 is activated. Um, destruction of transcription factor activity um, contributes a lot to the production or the uh, production of diseases like cancer, so to say. So studying and identifying these cell-specific signaling regulated transcription factors is important um, for humans understanding their health and how uh, diseases uh, progress and come up. And so cell surface proteins, they're typically um, found embedded in the cell membrane. They play a crucial role in the effective communication between cells. And they typically can create like a cascade of signaling that would affect transcription factors, ability to uh, regulate genes. And now on to my project, um, which was focused on Spartan. Um, now Spartan, like a lot of things in science, is an acronym. It stands for single cell put and RNA-based transcriptional factor activity network. It is a computational framework that links, or that is based on CiteSeq, which I previously mentioned, that links cell surface receptors to transcription factors. So due to prior knowledge, we know the relationship and interactions that transcription factors normally have with target genes. And so what um, Spartan is trying to do is uh, infer and predict the interaction between cell surface proteins and transcription factors. And so why is this significant, you may ask? Well, there are certain limitations to single cell um, technology. Um, cell, single cell genomic databases have not been used to link surface proteins to transcription factors. And hopefully by using Spartan, we can understand the role of protein signaling pathways and gene regulations in different types of cancers or breast cancers. And then with that, we can hopefully figure out how to target um, uh, these cancers and develop uh, certain treatments to combat them. Now, how Spartan works. So typically you would retrieve your data. Um, I use my data from an atlas of single cell RNA sequencing and site seq from uh, breast cancer. And so what I did was that I imported this uh, data set into uh, SCAMPI. SCAMPI is a feature of Python, if you may or may not have heard, which is a programming language, essentially. Okay. Um, and so when I upload it there, um, I also import the tools. So these tools um, in the top section here will be useful for me to analyze the data that I have um, inserted. And all of this is occurring on Juniper Notebook, um, which you could think of as like Word or like Excel, so to, so to say. And so once I have all my data, I have to make sure that it is viable and in the right format for it to be put through Spartan. And so how I would do that is that I would filter it out. So make sure that um, all the data that I have can be analyzed and that it's not too low um, for us to analyze. So to say. And then also normalizing it um, and finding what genes are being highly expressed. 
And from that, we can fit it through um, our Spartan model. Our Spartan model uses bilinear regression um, to um, for their cell types. And then from there, we can infer the transcription activities um, and hopefully figure out um, the link between transcription factors and surface proteins. And so for my first time running a Spartan, um, this is the data set or the data that we retrieved from that run. Um, on the left side or on the green portion, that is the activities found from transcription factors. And on the right uh, in the pink portion is the activities of cell surface proteins. Um, and so you can see that there are a few clusters within the data. Um, the color signifies if um, the data was highly or there was a lot more activity um, or a lot less low activity or so to say. So there are a few clusters um, within the data set here. Um, we got those very recently. So I wasn't able to fully analyze what it means, so to say. But we did at least confirm that Spartan can be used um, or that I, at least I confirm that I can apply Spartan on the publicly available data set that I got. Um, and it modeled the cytic data from the breast cancer tumors. And you can see a bit of the correlation um, between the cell surface proteins and the transcription factors that I had or on the um, heat map at least. And so then what we hope to do is finally look into the clusters. So what exactly um, did certain clusters mean between surface proteins and transcription factors. And then to hopefully apply this to other data sets and observe the trend. And so a lot of skills that I learned, I walked into this with no knowledge of coding whatsoever. So learning that I was working on the computational framework definitely scared me a bit. Um, but thankfully with, um, throughout the program, I was able to earn, uh, learn uh, Python, ScanBy, and more about uh, Spartan, which was the um, framework. And then reading research papers, which was definitely something I struggled with. And, and I think um, my mentors, uh, Dr. Ozan Dayaglu, April and Sing Hoon <laughs> for uh, helping me out there. And also um, the behind the scenes, behind the scene crew at the Hillman Cancer Center and as well as uh, the site heads. Come on, Dr. K. Let's go. I know you got questions. Oh. Um, so typically, like as you can see in this bottom portion, the data would be linked as in like there is a section for transcription factors and surface proteins. But um, because I'm new at coding and that there were a lot of coding mistakes, the data that we were somehow able to get was this. Um, and so for um, I would definitely find a way or at least as um, or like communicate with my mentors and help figure out a way to overlap the data. But that's typically how it should come out. Um, so that it would be like overlap and have the aisle for the transcription factors and cell surface proteins, but yeah. I before never really liked the computational side because I always, I like couldn't imagine like doing a whole bunch of lines of coding and then for it not to run and then trying to figure out which lines of code did not like work out. And so I just like, I always imagined that struggle. And then once I learned um, the coding portion of it, I definitely felt that struggle a lot. Um, but then it also showed me how to um, like persevere and look over my mistakes, and not get upset with myself because this was a new um, skill that I learned. And so I'm not totally like advanced and expert at it. So. It taught me to like um, appreciate that I do know how to learn it, or that I do that I did learn it, um, but just that it takes time at least. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. At first, I started learning with like tic tac toe games, or like Hangman, and so I really found that interesting from like just like a practice side. But definitely learning how to like build websites or like I don't know making a more advanced tic-tac-toe game. I don't know. I feel like that's definitely, I'm something I'm like very looking forward to. 
and then also applying it to perhaps my uh, desired career because Zhang Hoon informed me about nursing um, informatics or bioinformatics and something like that. And so that's something that I was like interested in because I never really heard about it. And so, yeah, I didn't know it was possible to do that with nursing. Um, I haven't thought about that personally because I was more focused on just making sure it ran um, because there was a whole protocol. So that's what I was I was worried about. But I don't know. If... Yes. Any other? Yeah. The reason why I wanted to go into the medical field, at least in nursing, was because in my case, I never felt like there was real representation um, as a Latinx woman in the medical field. And so like thinking about with coding as well, I've never seen any personally or like met any personally. So that did like hesitate me to pursue that line of uh, or that career field. Um, but yeah, I always like look towards people with a similar background um, to see how could they accomplish it and just like get inspired as well for pursuing. Oh, for sure, I already signed up. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to really compliment. I mean, this was a whole new experience for most of you, no matter what you were doing. But I think the ask of the people who took on coding, who had never coded before, because we're not the coding site, right? That's the bioinformatics site. But we have some mentors here who code, and we thought we'd really try to bring them into the program, be part of our, our community. And I'm really proud of the students who sort of were willing to take that jump. We polled you before we stuck you there mostly. Um, and so you, I think you've given us a lot of confidence that we can continue to build the program to be broad like that. Um, OK, so speaking of that, our Doris Duke um, speaker. Let me stop sharing and actually let me just get rid of this. Um, close that. So we are now going to be on Zoom. So um, Zanghun is going to do the introduction and then Yash, I assume you will have to do the Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce Yashi Pato. Yashi is undergrad at Basar College in New York. I want to just say one thing before you start. He is a previous high school student. Not, not, not me, not me, Yashi. No. Not me. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, Yashi is a returning student. Yeah. And Yashi is undergrad, now undergrad at Basar College in New York. So as he lives in New York, that's the reason he's not here. And I have not met Yashi in person. Yashi and I work remotely because we study bioinformatics. Working remotely is okay, no problem. Instead, Yashi had to study a lot, read the paper alone, and learn himself many things. 
It was a great experience to me working with self-motivating and self self-motivated and self-studying student. So today, Yashi is going to present about chromatin accessibility in human cancer. So I hope you enjoy uh, listen, listening to a little unique topic, Yashi present. Yashi, you waited for a long time, your time. Thank you, Sang Hoon, for the beautiful introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Yash, um, and I'm a Doris Stewart undergraduate intern. And this summer, I worked on age-associated chromatin accessibility in primary human breast and prostate carcinomas. Second. So before I begin explaining my research, it's important to understand chromatin structure and accessibility. Chromatin is basically a complex of DNA and histone proteins. And uh, there are two types of chromatin. There's a uh, euchromatin, which you can see here. And euchromatin is uh, open or accessible regions of chromatin that transcription factors and other proteins can bind to. And uh, the second type is heterochromatin, which you can see here. And it's the uh, complete opposite. These are tight or inaccessible regions of chromatin. And so uh, what are these transcription factors? These are proteins that uh, bind to DNA and regulate gene expression. And specifically, they bind to what's called a transcription factor binding motif. And these are just short nucleotide sequences that have a high affinity for transcription factors. So the way we experimentally analyze chromatin structure and accessibility is through a method called uh, TAC-seq. And this falls in the field of epigenomics, which is the uh, study of the genome-wide processes that regulate how and when genes are turned on or off. Um, TAC-seq stands for Assay of Transposites Accessible Chromatin Sequencing. And it's a technique developed in 2013 used to identify accessible regions of DNA called peaks, and these are also the uh, open regions. And uh, looking at the figure on the left, you can see how TAC-seq works. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, chromatin has both closed and open regions, and uh, TAC-seq relies on a TN5 transposome enzyme to cut open these open regions. And um, once we have these DNA fragments, they're amplified, sequenced, and um, they're mapped back to a reference genome. And the resulting data is uh, genome-wide chromatin accessibility peak data that we can uh, finally use for analysis. So we use taxic data in this research to study age-associated patterns in cancer. Um, disparities in cancer biology between young and old patients exist but are unclear. And these differences can be due to types of mutations and the gene say influence. They can be because of uh, all and biological pathways related to cancer, or in our case, they can be in chromatin structure and accessibility. Um, this figure right here is from a research article published in 2021, and it shows a process of figuring out uh, which cancer types are age associated. And on the y axis here, you can see the different cancer types and their abbreviations. In our study, we use breast cancer, which is abbreviated BRCA and prostate cancer, which is abbreviated PRAD. And you can see that uh, these cancers over here with the orange bars are were determined to be age associated, which means that um, older patients uh, of these cancer types have worse outcomes. So the data set that we used was taxi data of primary breast and prostate cancer from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And specifically this data comes from a study done in 2018 called the Compton Accessibility Landscape of Primary Human Cancers. And uh, in the study, they sequenced using TACSEQ 23 different cancers. And you can see the different cancers they sequenced in this figure here. And um, in figure B, uh, the, in the x-axis are the cancer types and the bars above them, the, the numbers you see here are the number of patients sequenced for that cancer type. So as I said earlier, we used the breast cancer data set, which has 75 patients, and the prostate cancer data set, which has 26 patients sequence. And so the goal of our research was to find the differences in chromatin accessibility between 
young and old cancer patients and breast and prostate cancer. So our first step was to figure out what exactly young and old patients mean. So we had to figure out how to classify them that way. And so first we downloaded the taxic data of the patients from TCGA. We then separated uh, the data set by age into five equal quintiles. So each quintile represents 20% of the data. And so we kept the first and fifth quartiles to represent uh, young and old respectively. And we cut out the middle 60% of the data. So for uh, the breast cancer data set, uh, we start off with 75 uh, patients. And after cutting out the middle 60% of the data, we were left with 29 patients, 15 of which were in the first quintile that represent the young patients, and 14 of which were in the fifth quintile, which represents the old patients. Um, for prostate cancer, we start off with 26 patients, but after cutting out the middle 60%, we were left with 11 patients, six of which uh, were young, were in the young group, and five of which were in the old group. So uh, we, we wanted to first find a relationship within the data, so we used principal component analysis, which is basically a technique used to analyze large volumes of data, find differences or relationships, or you can see it as a summary representing the essence of the data. And um, you can see the PCA plots here. Each dot represents a patient's chromatin accessibility profile, and the uh, green dots represent old patients, while the red dots represent young patients. And we can see for uh, breast cancer, there isn't a lot of separation in the PCA plot, but for uh, prostate cancer, we do see two distinct clusters, which is a good thing. And so we wanted to further explore these epigenetic differences. And so we uh, then found uh, differentially accessible peaks. And these are regions of chromatin that are more open or accessible in young patients than old patients or vice versa. And um, in the volcano plots shown below, each dot uh, represents one P and those dots, the red dots represent peaks that are significant or uh, they're enriched or more abundant in uh, either young or old patients. And for breast cancer, we see that uh, there are about 3000 significant peaks, which is 1.5% uh, of the total number. But for uh, prostate cancer, we found 25,000 significant peaks, which is 23% um, of the total number of peaks that we have. So we then visualized um, the significant peaks using heat maps. And you can see the heat map here. Each column in this heat map is a sample. There were, again, for breast cancer, there were 15 young patients, which are represented by this half of the heat map. And there were 14 old patients that are represented by this half. And um, each row is a significant differentially accessible peak. The top portion are those peaks enriched in the young, and the bottom portion are the peaks enriched in old. And so um, in this heat map, red means that the peak is enriched, and blue means the opposite. Um, we can see that these peaks here are enriched in young, and we can visualize these peaks here to be enriched in the old. And uh, we also made these pie charts. We wanted to see um, basically the percentage of differentially accessible taxi peaks that overlap with a specific genomic region, such as the promoter, intron, et cetera. And uh, we can see from these um, pie charts that for both young and old patients, a majority of the peaks overlap with either the intergenic region or the intron region. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, transcription factor binding motifs are short sequences that transcription factors bind to. And um, we use the software called Homer to identify the top 10 uh, enriched motifs in each age group, which you can see in this table here, along with the transcription factor that binds to these motifs. And so um, interestingly, we found that in the young patient group, uh, most of these transcription factors were associated with developmental pathway. And uh, we did the same type of analysis, but for prostate cancer as well. So in this heat map, you can see these are the peaks enriched in the young, and these are the peaks enriched in the old. And again, we did the uh, pie charts 
uh, for both young and old patients. Again, a majority of peaks were overlapped with either an intragenic or intron region. And we also used Homer again to find the top 10 uh, most enriched motifs. And similar to breast cancer, uh, young prostate cancer patients also had uh, transcription factors mostly associated with developmental pathways. So we wanted to see what exactly these differentially accessible peaks functionally mean. So after finding, after first finding these peaks, we then classified, we then uh, mapped each peak to a gene and classified the function of these genes using the Panther classification system. And this system is basically just a curated biological database of gene families to classify the function of genes. And um, finally, we found the enriched pathways of the differentially accessible peaks in both prostate cancer and breast cancer. And interestingly, we found that uh, immune cell activation, not signaling, and the oxidative stress response were all commonly enriched in both prostate and breast cancer in uh, young patients specifically. So uh, in summary, we identified the chromatin accessibility differences between young and old patients in breast and prostate cancer. We identified the 10 most enriched uh, transcription factor binding motifs in each cancer type and age group. And finally, we mapped differentially acceptable pieces of their corresponding genes and classified gene function in each cancer type and uh, age group. I'd like to thank the uh, Hillman Academy for making this program possible, specifically Dr. Boone, Solomon, and Stephen. I'd like to thank the Austin Bay Google Lab for having me and supporting me throughout all of my uh, research, especially my mentor, Sang Hoon. He helped me answer all my questions through every step. And I'd like to thank the Doris Duke Foundation for funding my research. Thank you guys for listening. and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Yash. Very good presentation. Wonderful. My name is Jian Yu. I have a question for you. I think that when you're looking at the ATAC-6 data, looking for chromatin accessibility, have you thought about, uh, that was in the cancer, right? So have you thought about it, similar changes or some changes might be also in the normal tissue in the young and old person? That's an interesting uh, thought. Yeah, as you, as you said, our taxi data was from the tumors and tumor samples, but uh, we haven't tried doing the analysis on normal tissue. But um, I presume that um, the differences, there would also be differences with normal tissue as well. The profile may be, may be helpful for us. I have a question sort of related to um, the issue of what cells are in the samples that are in that database, and I don't know if you've discussed that with your mentor, but how, I mean, when you dissect the tumor out, you have all kinds of other cells besides the tumor cells, the microenvironmental cells. And I don't know from some of these studies how clean those samples are and whether you might be looking at things that are microenvironmental versus tumor. And if anybody's playing around with trying to tease that out from these data sets, I don't know if they can. Right. Yeah, I'm not really sure how pure these uh, samples are either. I assume um, they just um, sequence a uh, portion of the cells. But I'm not really sure if uh, there were specific type of cell they sequenced or if they just uh, took multiple cells. Somebody else have a question? Well, Yash, thank you for joining yeah. us. Uh, Thank you. Great to have you be part of the CB group again. Um, so I guess we are um, breaking for lunch. 
And then after lunch at two o'clock, be reconvening in this room with the entire academy.